All right. Happy Wednesday to you guys. I'm uh, learning some of the uh, behind the scene things. Thanks to my boy, London. Uh, really kind of keep things more interactive. Like you guys said, you, you, you know, you appreciate the fact that we're kind of being uh, more as a family, as a group. And that's something that we want to keep moving forward into 2023. If you'll notice, we're really trying to make it where things are organized and we're propping up, in my opinion, some of the the brightest minds that we have here, um, Marco, that, that I have, you know, in my Rolodex. And, and that, you know, the audience might not necessarily have heard of NJ last week, uh, but I hope that you guys go back and, and watch his video. Um, you know, he's he's really creating medicine for the community and he's been doing it for a while. And uh, he's just somebody that I think a lot of people need to listen to. He's somebody that I personally admire. Like, I think just his, his energy, who he is as a person is contagious. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out, um, you know, check him out. That's his uh, logo right there as well. And then a, another reason I, you know, giving an extra shout out today to MJ is because he's been like the hype man for Robbie since I can remember, to be honest. I mean, he's been out there doing his thing, going to all the events, talking about nerd genetics, talking about nerd genetics, talking about nerd genetics, growing those genetics. I'd be going to, um, you know, s some different events and that kind of stuff. And uh, without letting the person know, I, you know, I knew that they were getting that from MJ because there's just nobody else that hyped it, especially with the Wody and like all these like uh, just kind of like classic strains I felt like that were found here in Denver. So, um, you know, now from what I understand, it's going uh, nationally and as well as internationally. We we're talking to London uh, right before we came on here live. So uh, when you put in the work, which Robbie does, uh, you have a hype man like uh, like MJ, uh, then of course you're gonna find success. And you you know you know salute and hats off to you, Robbie, because mm -hmm. I've even personally wanted to hang out with you at an event before because I just think you're a, a great human being. And I hope more people uh, find out about your genetics uh, moving forward. Oh, thank you for that intro. That's that's amazing. And uh, you know, before we go any further, I also want to give my support to MJ because. That dude really is brilliant, and uh, I've seen him really put in the work over the years. I mean, when we first met, uh, probably like 2015, 16, somewhere in there, uh, you know, he was already doing it pretty big, and where he is now um, compared to where he is then is such a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, it just really shows that if you have passion and you have drive, you can really do anything you want to. And I, I just, I love seeing that out there. Uh, I love his energy and I love that you guys are, you know, really showing, giving him his props, giving him his flowers, you know what I'm saying? So. Nice. Yeah. I want to give, uh, Marco the, the mic for a little bit and then we'll get into it, Robbie. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, man, when you said you were having on NERS genetics, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know a lot about NERS genetics, Robbie, but when Brian put that stamp on it for me, you know, I mean, pretty much he said, hey, this guy is legit. He knows his shit. And that's what I'm looking for. I love uh, genetics, which are proven, which are solid. You know what I mean? I've tried a lot of different things as a grower over the years, a lot of people's gear, the hype stuff, you know, the stuff that supposed to be all that doesn't end up being that sometimes so i really appreciate the person that just grinds puts in that work and puts out that good quality uh time after time so really looking forward to man just talking to you and learning some stuff today you know i've been like i said growing different things and right now i got two males you know that i'm holding on to which i'm going to save a little bit of pollen you know what i mean and just kind of start really getting serious about you know going after some traits that i want for myself and and doing that kind of thing so man it's going to be really good to kind of get into all that kind of stuff and um yeah man with that said i don't know a lot about you so why don't you just kind of um you know tell us all about a little bit of what you want us to know about yourself and kind of how long you've been doing it how you started and where you're at right now and kind of plans for the future you know how we do we just have a good conversation here man and just keep it going so um, you know, that's, uh, this plant found me, um, like, like so many of us, like that, I, I didn't really know that I was, I was choosing this life. Um, it, it sort of found me, um, when I was, uh, in college, uh, I ran cross country and, uh, I was running some absurd number of miles a week, like, you know, around a hundred miles a week, um, to, you know, be competitive on this cross country team. And three days before regionals, my junior year, I broke both my feet at the same time. I woke up and got out of bed and collapsed, just like went straight to ground. Um, 
they took me in for x-rays, told me I had stress fractures in my second metatarsal of both of my feet. Um, and the next statement that they made was, you know, if you want to, you could still run the race in three days, but it's just going to hurt like hell. And uh, my cross country coach looked at me and said, well, what do you think, Rob? And so I, I ran the race because I'm dumb or, you know, was young at the time. Uh, but uh, I ran the race and uh, it set uh, a chain of events in place that have like determined everything else afterwards. Um, so after running the race, um, I ran the second fastest time that I had ever run in any five mile course um, in all of the years, but I, it was the last race that I was ever able to run. Um, I, it, it fully just like, just broke my whole body. Um, three months after, uh, that race, I went to do my study abroad trip, um, for college. And, uh, it just so happened that I was going to Holland, um, that like that just happened to be the, like the one that worked with, with my, my program of study and like all of the different things that like I was going to Holland. Right. So I get to Holland, um, and the first thing that we do after I've gotten out of my boot um, is go on a, like a three-day walking tour over cobblestones, um, and I just immediately broke both feet again. And so now I'm in Europe. Um, I'm there all by myself as like a 20, 21-year-old kid, um, and uh there is nothing about the like West or the like American medical system that really translates to that place. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really beautiful things about their medical system. But what, what came about of it to make a long story short is they suggested that um, in order to deal with the, the, the pain of having two broken feet and walking on cobblestones um, that I explore cannabis. And like I, I had been exposed to cannabis before. It, it was, it was something that like you know I'd smoked weed or whatever. But like there at the time, it was a very different thing. It, it was like the the first time when I was able to see all of the different uh, um, strains and what cannabis could really do. You know, like with, before that, up until that point, if you saw cannabis in the United States, for the most part, unless you were a really like lucky person, you were getting whatever your dude had, you know, like however that worked out, that's, that's what you were getting. And it was, it was going to be that, and I, that's as good as it, get, as it is, you know, but then I'm in Holland and I can order off a menu and I can pick things and I can go back to strains that like are actually helping in some ways. And like, I can avoid strains that are hurting in other ways. And I just got absolutely fascinated with this plant. And so I came back, um, after, after that trip, um, mostly healed, mostly my feet were mostly healed. Um, but the, you know, fire inside me had been lit. Right. So, um, I immediately started, uh, you know, uh, growing in, what first was a very small, small scale. I mean, most of the viewers out there, if you saw my first grow, you would laugh, truly. You know, it was it was hilarious. Um, and, you know, awesome for what it was, but uh, compared to where, where we built, you know, it didn't happen overnight. And so um, over time, uh, I was exposed to different things and different people. Um, when I moved to Boulder, I met two groups of people. Um, one, um, they kind of got me started on the like uh, the the basics of like where I needed to resource myself um, on on how to take clones, on what kind of lights to buy, on like all all the different things. And then another group out of Florida that ended up mentoring me for a lot of years, basically up until um, we started Nerds and Beyond, um, and they had been doing it for really, really long time, like since the early nineties. And the game went from something that was done because uh, it was a personal fascination to suddenly, this is something that I could do that I can help a lot of people with. And I can start to bring a whole lot of, of really interesting things to all these people. Cause at 2014, I don't know if you guys really remember, but it was hard to buy seeds. It is, it was not like it is today where there are seeds on every corner, you know, like it was hard to find seeds and scary. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was scary to buy them. You know, like you had to find somebody to do it. You never knew what you were going to get. There was always like all these different stuff. Like I remember ordering from uh, Barney's Seed Bank um, out of Amsterdam. And, I, you know, I know now that what I got was not from Barney's Seed Bank. Um, but I grew out a plant that I grew for 120 days and never produced any usable weed. Uh, like it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and never flowered. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, it was the only thing I can compare it to is this land race American hemp that, that I saw out in Kansas. Um, it was like, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. And it was supposed to be vanilla Kush because I mean, this thing was 12 feet tall. There was no way it was a Kush. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was know, what it was. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, whatever it was, it was, it was wild. Crazy. But um, at that time, you know, like the, we saw this huge need, you know, and I remember talking to uh, the guy that I founded Nerds with, and uh, we were, we were walking through the mountains and we were talking about, you know, like why it is that is it's so hard to find all these good genetics and why it is that like, because we're in Colorado and the doors just opened we can have you know 70 awesome strains in, in between our crews um and the rest of the world is fighting to find one you know so uh that's really where where it all started that, and like from there there's been a, a whole lot of evolution for sure but where it really started was like how can we make it so that the people who want to grow their own have something to grow have something to look through, have something to learn how to phenotype or pheno hunt with. Um, and you know, that's really where it started. So. Nice. Yeah, man, it was sketchy. And I will say I used to mess with Barney's and I've tried some different strains with that stuff. And it was very inconsistent. Like you said, like, you know, you got what you got, you know, pretty much, man. So yeah, I, I can relate to that a hundred percent. Yeah, we've joked on the show, Rob, about like it was some of that shit. The T-shirt was with more than the genetics they shipped you. So a lot of that stuff um, was just kind of like flying blind. I remember, you know, Greenhouse was a Greenhouse Seeds with the Super Lemon Haze. I don't know if you guys have ever messed around yeah. with that. Um, for me, that was the only one that seemed like I ever got the real deal stuff and could play around with it. And it's one of those, oh, I wish I could go back. And, um, you know, there were some genetics out there that were just – uh, really hard to get a hold of. And now here we are in Denver, uh, Marco. We have one of the, one of the, I think one of the bigger brains on the subject. So we want to talk about genetics, uh, but we want to nerd out with genetics. And I think the community deserves that with like just really kind of breaking things down. That's why I reached out to you. Um, you know, you live up to, to the name that you decided for your brand. Um, and, and there's something to that when individuals like MJ and, and people like, you know, in his little circle where they're able to create just something for themselves because of the work that you've done. So I wanted to talk about more how you're able to create stable genetics that, if, you know, we'll be candid here, that, that feed people's families. I mean, your stuff is so solid that other ind that other individuals are willing to, you know, risk their entire basement with, with your gear. And I think a lot of that came based off of MJ's kind of like co-sign um for for being friends with you where a lot of people started to just find out who you were um and i i hope after today as well obviously that's continuing but you know can we dive deeper sir when you're talking about genetics like i, th I think a lot of us understand the, the basics of breeding but what mm -hmm. what is the stuff where you're really finding you have an eye for this obviously so what what are, what are these girls when they're going through this what makes them stand out yeah uh you know the the simple answer to that, Brian, is that being a good breeder is being a good grower. And, uh, you know, when uh, part of being a good grower is uh, learning to be absolutely brutal with your selection process. And uh, something that, that like any real seed head is going to find out if they like ever take this in, into any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of big scale, like even like, uh, let's say for you, 10 plants is a big scale that that can be a big scale, but whatever a big scale is to you, if you start going through and realizing, okay, I'm going to pop 10 different seeds and I'm going to go through and I'm going to select which one of this that keeps going. And then I'm going to pop 10 more seeds. Well, suddenly 
you've got 20 things that you have to select from. And uh, if you aren't able or willing to uh, decide what it is that you care about and what it is that you're, you're looking for, then there's no other steps. There's you're, you're done there in the water. Um, so, you know, a huge part of, uh, of this is that if you want to be a breeder, um, you got to decide you, you, what you want to grow for, you know, like what, what do you want to bring to the world? What do you want to bring to these things? And, um, we'll go deeper on all of this stuff. I'm just kind of getting started a little bit, but, um, Definitely. you know, I think that, that realistically that's, that's the first question that everybody needs to ask, you know, um, I'm going to liken this to skateboarding real quick because I think it's a really good analogy. Um, I have been lifelong skateboarder. I'm not good by any means. Don't get that. <laughs> Don't get that impression, but I love it. Um, and when you are in a skate park, you can see the difference between the people who learned to ride the board first and the people who just wanted to do tricks. And, uh, there's, there's a different style. There's a different flow. There's a different everything. And when you look at breeders who didn't learn to grow first and just wanted to be a breeder, then there's a different style and there's a different flow and there's a different outcome and there's a different everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that, that when, when we're looking at this, like the, the ones who really fall in love with this, who are here for the time, um, that are going to be breeders 10, 15, 20 years from now, they're going to be breeders 10, 15, 20 years from now because they love this plant. They love every bit about this plant. They love the nuances. They love the hunt. They love the fact that it's not always the same. They love the fact that sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it worked all the time, this, this would be an awful, awful thing. <laughs> like it just, it, it would be okay, I guess. Um, but it, it wouldn't be interesting. You know, part of, uh, part of what keeps it interesting is because sometimes it doesn't work and you have no idea why it doesn't work. And uh, I, I think that's a, a really interesting part is that, um, you know, I think that there's been, in, in some ways, like the, the breeding community has been sort of put on a, a little bit of a pedestal and, and uh, part of of the reason that um, I'm not sure that, that that's always correct and some of the reason that it is sometimes correct um, it goes back to the the love and the reasons that why we're doing this in the first place you know like they if it's all all just about um, the the money that can be made from it then this won't last because like uh, this is an art you know, growing is an art, breeding is an art, and uh, um, you have to learn to hone your skills in order to best portray the art that you see in your head. And, you know, growing is the first skill that you have to learn. Like, that is that is the drawing to painting. Um, and, uh, you know, we... I've probably spent the vast majority of my career trying to be a better grower. Um, and as a result, that's made me a better breeder. And then what has been super interesting is uh, trying to become a better hash maker has also made me a better breeder. Um, because I, I've learned so many different things about the, the plant and the way that it expresses in, in uh, um, ice water hash and uh, rosin and things like that, um, that it has made me rethink the questions about what I was selecting for in the first place and whether or not something might have been a keeper that I didn't understand was a keeper at the time. Mm. That's deep. Well, I got a question staying on that same topic, but going back to kind of starting off um, mm -hmm. that brutal selection process. Yeah. I'm always a fan of tough love when it comes to like, you know, selecting things, you know, I feel like you got to put it through its paces now, what's your thoughts on that? Because there's two lines of thinking. Well, man, I got these seeds. I just should I nurture everyone, make sure everyone gets to the, to the finish line so I can flower it and see what it's all about. Or do I take that pack and say, well, two of them struggle coming out the gate. I don't want those. You know what I mean? Oh, shit. Missed a day of water in here. Halfway through, lost a couple more. That's okay. 
And then you whittle that down kind of with a tough selection process to you got five or maybe even only four out of that 10 starting out with it even survive. What, what's the thought process? Should you focus more on getting all 10 to the finish line starting out or just go ahead and whittle them on out? You know what I mean? Well, all right. So there are, there are sort of, there, there are two directions that we can go with this question. And I want to talk about both of them. Um, the uh, first one is, okay, so what is your goal? Are you a commercial grower or are you a home grower, right? Because if you're a commercial grower, there's a totally different line of thinking that I think that you need to take than if you're a home than if you're a, a, a home grower and you're just growing for yourself, right? So let's let's just real quickly go down the the home grower. I'm just growing for myself situation. If you are a home grower and you're just growing for yourself, then the most important thing that comes out of it, in my opinion, is the flower. And uh, the the goal should be to have the best flower as your medicine. Um, so in that particular case, I think the best strategy would be to try and nurture all 10 plants and get them to the end to find out if any of the flowers are something that, that works for your system, um, that, that is going to benefit your life and not take away from it. Um, and... Uh, you know, cause not all weeds work with all people. That's something that I've definitely seen in, in the years. And it's for, certainly true for me. There are some strains that I just honestly can't smoke. Other of my friends will tell me it's their favorite thing and I will, I'll get a panic attack from it, you know, or, or something like that. So I think it's, it's reasonable that we uh, need to, to put into the, the conversation, like, you need to be able to select for you if you're a home grower and you are are growing for just your your personal medicine needs or personal desires. Like you know, some strains are going to work better for you, and you should grow those. Um, but uh, if you're a commercial grower, there's a whole different line of of parameters that you have to think about. Um, and so, like if you're a commercial grower and you're doing a commercial pheno hunt. Um, I think that really the way to do it then is to uh, do it more in the the other style you were talking about, where you give them incredibly tough love, where you try and put it through a system where you're not giving them any anything and seeing what shines. You know, like in a commercial grow, depending on how big your commercial grow is, you have the ability to go through, uh, or if you build a pheno hunt room you have the ability to go through however many you need to, to fit your audience. Right. Um, in those cases, you know, I think that it's really important to select away from things that you could potentially not get to flower in a commercial space. You know, if you're pheno hunting for something that has to make money, then your goal has to be getting to the end product every single time, no matter what. And in that case, it's probably better for you to sacrifice a little bit of quality of end product in order to make sure that the end product you get is quality, if that makes sense. Um, you know, if it's easier to grow and it's easier to get out in a situation where you're just not able to give them the same amount of love, because let's be honest, there's no commercial grow in the world that can give a thousand plants the same love that somebody gives 10 or one. It's just not possible. Um, there, there's not enough energy to spread around in the world. So we, when you look at that kind of situation, you need to hunt for different stuff. And uh, you know, when I'm hunting for a commercial facility, it's a totally different per, uh, list of parameters than maybe if I'm hunting for myself. Um, and both are totally valid. But I would also say that for me as a, a breeder and a commercial grower, most of the time when I do pheno hunts, I hunt as a commercial grower. Um, because in order for me to keep however many strains that I'm keeping at a time, which is generally a lot, um, you know, in uh, our Oklahoma facility, I think we have about a hundred um, pheno, hunt, pheno hunted cuts right now. Um, and, you know, that list is ever expanding. Expanding, uh, I think he froze there for a second. Yeah, I, the last thing I heard was a hundred 
uh, rooted fe- uh, pheno hunts, clones from pheno hunts. Yeah, and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I reached out to Rob is you know he he put it he puts in the work. Uh, uh, while... Hello, all right, we're back. There we are, guys. Yep. Yeah, all right. The last thing we heard was a uh, hundred uh, pheno hunts. Am I back? Yep. Can you hear us? Yeah, he's getting it back. It looks like. Hello. Hey, can you hear us? If you can hear us, leave and come back. Can you hear us, Rob? Um, guy, I don't know if you can hear me, but I can't hear anything. I got totally disconnected. Um, we can hear you now. Can you hear us now? I pushed yeah, it. Looks like he's leaving and coming back. But yeah, man, this is um, yeah, this is getting. I mean, it's gonna be great, man. I wanted to just leave the gold bar up the whole time because everything's just pretty much bars, like. From he'll come back on. I'm not tripping. So, from from just the way he does things, man, the way he broke that down, you know, the way you do it from home grower standpoint to a commercial. I hope this shit is really, you know, people are are hearing this because I think it makes a lot of sense, and I can't wait to really get into his strains. Yeah, no, there he is. Hey, I'm so sorry, guys. No problem, man. We have uh, technical difficulties every now and then. All right, all the time. I, 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 you can I hear us now, though, right? I'm not sure where it shut off. I can, yes. All right. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, you're bringing up the, the selections, um, and especially, you know, being out in Oklahoma, all of a sudden, all these different shops are, are popping up. People, at, you know, mm-hmm. newer to farming, they want to pheno hunt. And I've seen, uh, like, small mom and pop operations. That was actually part of their downfall is they just didn't have stable genetics to pay the bills they went after all these different genetics at first. So I wanted to kind of talk about more of on the commercial side. It does seem like if you're building out a facility, you need something that is your stable. And that's kind of why we, we named part of the show about that is building out your stable. You need stable genetics, uh, horses, the thoroughbreds, if you will, uh, that are going to carry you through that, you know, can pay the bill so that eventually you can get to the point where you start to play around with a lot of stuff. But if you pheno hunt from day one and the and the facility is too big, in my opinion, you might shoot yourself in the foot uh, because you just don't know how those crops are going to produce. Um, so that was something else that I wanted to talk about on you know on a grander scale that I don't think a lot of people think about at first. Yes, everything that you just said, amen. Um, uh, commercial growers worldwide, please turn up your volume right now and listen to what I have to say. Do not pheno hunt in your commercial facility please stop doing that period create your own pheno hunt facility have a stable when we're talking about a commercial facility we're talking about something that needs to be able to pay the bills of the business it's like th- this is not a, like a, a section that really is up for debate um and at the end of the day th- one of the hardest things that you can do on yourself is try and pheno hunt in that big room. Now, is it fun in some ways? Yeah, sure. It is. It's really cool. You get to see a whole bunch of big plants, but that is probably the dumbest business decision you can possibly make in commercial growing. And I see it all the time. And as a a seed breeder, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I want you to take my seeds. And yes, I want you to run them out in your commercial facility. But no, I do not want you to do it that way. Um, Because at at the end of the day, one, when you're going through a thousand plants, even if it's a thousand of the same strain, it is so difficult to hold on to all of the genetic material between one generation to the next. And then to be able to consume the amount that you would need to be able to adequately judge whether or not there's a real difference between the two um, is also just a tremendous ask. You know, so if you are in a commercial facility and you have one strain that you can run out while you are doing pheno hunts to find your new best thing, great. 
that's awesome. That's the beginning of your stable. That's that's where you you start start the races from. Because at the end of the day, that's what keeps you able to be in the market. And yeah, you know, Blue Dream did that for a lot of people, for a lot of people. Um, AK-47 did that for a lot of people. Do you know how many strains were able to be developed because AK-47 paid the bills? You know, like the, the reality is that when you're looking at this from like a total commercial standpoint, um, you can provide better medicine to your end customer. You can provide a better life for yourself and you can provide better flower just in general. If you understand that your commercial room is your commercial room and it needs to be kept to a limited number of strains and those strains need to like the same thing. And the best way that you can possibly scale craft is to try and scale by creating small spaces that can be uh, individual for the, the way that the plant needs to, to be supported. Because at the end of the day, AK-47 doesn't need the same thing that Neville's Hayes does. Um, and it's not going to thrive in the same room that Neville's Hayes is going to thrive in. Um, and actually, Neville's Hayes is probably not going to thrive in a room at all. Um, it's going to do real good in a greenhouse or outside, but it, it struggles indoors. So, you know, when we're looking at, at how to create a stable, the that's where um, what we were talking about before I got cut off um, with Marco's question of, of, you know, how do you pheno hunt? I, I think that's the very first question that you need to ask when you're going into this as a commercial grower is, okay, what am I going to grow right now? What can I grow that's good enough to to get me through till I, I do the next thing? Because um, there's there's a there's sort of a weird dichotomy here, right? It's a double edged sword. Um, we're we're in a situation where you need to be able to have a stable, but you need to be able to have a stable that's unique to you. Um, because if everybody is growing Gorilla Glue and you know, it can be anything. If everybody's going blue dream or everybody's growing cookies or whatever, then we're racing to the bottom. There's uh, it's who can produce the cookies or the, the blue dream or the gorilla glue, the cheapest um, and, and get it to the end user, the cheapest, um, the best quality at the cheapest, you know? So um, in a commercial standpoint, it's really important for you to be able to differentiate, differentiate yourself in some way. Um, and, uh, if you're a dispensary or you're a rosin maker or you're a grow and you're coming with the same thing that everybody else is coming to the table with, then you're either going to differentiate yourself with quality or you're going to differentiate yourself with price. But if you can have something that's totally unique, um, if everybody is, is giving you gas and you can bring fruit then like suddenly you might have a niche of the market that um, is going to come and shop directly with you only because you're providing them the need that they want. And, you know, as a breeder, it's really interesting because when I started this whole thing, um, it was all about what I liked, you know, and I, I have a pretty diverse palette for this plant, but, um, at the beginning, it really was all about um, the things that I was hyped on at the time and trying to make them better and whatnot. But over time, one of the things that has been really interesting, um, as more people have been able to grow out the strains, as more people have been able to use them as medicine and give us feedback, then in places that like I didn't understand were, were really important, things have shown up as really important. Like For example, I have this sex grenade strain. Um, which is uh, Lemon G times uh, Dr. Hoffman. And Dr. Hoffman uh, is one of the, the first strains that I made and then started stabilizing. And it's um, acid from uh, Paradise Seeds, I believe, um, in Amsterdam, and uh, uh, Sour Pez from La Plata Labs in Denver. Um, the La Plata Labs uh, uh, Sour Pez mail that I found um, just you know, like really stood out at the time. And it was one of those things where uh, it was kind of like what Marco was talking about. He had, uh, 
he had a couple of really good dudes and he wanted to try something. Well, that's, that's where I was too. I was, I found something that, that really stood out in the hundreds of seeds that I'd been popping. And, uh, I wanted to see what the next step was. And the next step ended up being pretty good. And then we, we kept, you know, working down the line. But anyway, the point that I brought up with this is that that was one of the first strains that I made where the feedback that I got from it was that it was really helping people medically where there was something that, that was different about it than it was, than every other strain that was on the shelves of the dispensary. Um, and more than any other strain that I've released, that one has been one that people have come back to me routinely to tell me that it is, is medicinally incredibly beneficial to them. And this is a place where like my flavor profile doesn't really match that one anymore. Um, it's not something that like I really enjoy smoking but we will make it forever because of how much it has helped people. And, you know, uh, I want to continue um, working lines with whatever it is it's in it that is doing that. And so like that sparked a whole new level of interest in the plant for me, because there's something else happening with that strain that isn't happening with some of the other ones. Um, and so to have that feedback, uh, it made me look at it from a different angle, a different perspective, I suppose. And uh, that that has made the whole the whole journey of breeding um, so interesting because, you know, originally it was all about getting high and, and just, you know, the, the mental benefits that come from that and the, the joys of, of uh, you know, being able to have that community and whatnot. But um, over the period of time with different selection and different breeding, it's been about a lot more than that because I've seen how much it helps people for different stuff. And some of it is just the mental part of it. You know, having a strain that's real mellow that people can smoke all day that, that really, you know, takes that edge off and, and allows them to function at a higher level. There's that, that's a hundred percent good to me. I don't see that as, as, as any part bad. So, you know, like you can value the, the different effects from this plant um, in a lot of different ways. And from what I've seen, a lot of people have different values for how it interacts with their lives. Um, so as I get that feedback, um, you know, another thing that has become real interesting is like, well, how do I continue to breed for this? How do I select for these things that I didn't know six years ago were a thing at all? So nice yeah man great info but getting back to the males a little bit so i have a, some scenario we can walk through mm -hmm. um i had three males uh same strain this Are is from uh, yep. yep same strain uh mendo breath from king j uh he sent me yep. some seeds to uh to run through help him select some things or whatever um so i run those kept the three males one was just kind of okay you know this one doesn't look good not the one so kind of just toss that one out no stem rub either mm -hmm. the other two one has a little more stem rub and then that one is also has like longer node spacing if that matters they're both very beautiful males if you will uh but one's kind of the, the it's very tighter node space and one's longer but they both look good would you keep those separate or go ahead and just collect it together as my Mendo breath pollen and use it down the road. Is it that, you know, finite to look at it that way? No. Uh, well, all right. They're, they're, man, that's, that is such an incredibly hard question to answer. I know, man. Uh, those are the kind of questions that I, that I have for myself as I'm living. No, uh, <laughs> you're going to get a great answer to it. Trust me. All right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> like, there's nuances to it, you know, um, Okay, so the first question that I have in order to answer this question is, uh, did you run the girls out? The girls are currently running. Um, they're like, uh, no, I'm, they're just vegging right now. They're just vegging. Okay. So the one of the easiest ways to select a male is to select a female. Um, so if when you run out all of your girls, um, and, and granted, Everybody out there, PSA, this doesn't always work. But as a general rule, if you run out all of your girls and you find um, girls that you really like 
and you can look at the growth traits of them. Um, you can look at the serration of their leaves. You can look at the stem rub. You can look at the width of the uh, um, the stalk itself. You can look at whether or not the stalk is hollow. You can look at the lateral branching. You can look at the uh, uh, flower structure eventually, both male and female. Um, and you let can... me stop you there, Robbie. Do you care if the stems are hollow? Let's go back yeah. to that right there. Okay, well, break, yeah, break that down. That is the thing I select for. Okay. Um, because in the seed stage, uh, when uh, when you are sort of you're looking for vigorous growth. Um, and, uh, you know, having hollow stems in like a commercial clone stage is not actually a, a very good thing per se. Like there, there's a level to where it's good, but then after that, it's not anymore. Um, but during the, the, uh, seed phase, one of the things that I'm looking for is vigor in the, in the, the seed itself. And so when you see that, that means that the plant is growing faster than it, like, than it can kind of keep up with. Um, and so that, that's a sign of just like amazing vigor in the plant. Well, the let me stop you there then, because, um, genome alchem alchemy's Fantasia girls. Remember I, Brian, I was saying they're growing like it's like they're in hydro, like they're, they're literally stems like that. And when I went to do some LST and, and squ squeeze them, I'm like, damn, they're hollow as hell. Like it was literally like that hydro. So that's dope, man. So that there reinforces again, good genetics, you know? Yeah, so the reason that I'm looking for vigor and I'm looking for that in the seed generation is because when I take this to a clone generation, it's going into my either my commercial or my home grow, right? It's something that I'm going to rely on one way or the other. And if it's weak from the beginning, it's going to be weak as a clone and then it's going to be weak in every uh, aspect of its life afterwards, you know, like um, bugs mildew hplvd all these things are going to attack a weak plant faster than they're going to attack a, a vigorous plant um you know pythium same thing so like uh, whenever you look at a lot of the common problems that you have as a grower part of it to do to do to do to do is that your genetics are weak and you didn't select well and uh that's because nobody teaches this stuff so let's teach some people Guys, when you are selecting, look for the plant that is going to be strong. Put it into bad situations, because if it survives a bad situation and still comes out really good, then at the end of the time, you're always going to have medicine, either for you or for your customers. Um, you know, like if you can get through and not feed something for 10 days and everything else is dead, but that plant is alive, that plant has something special you know so like it really matters that tough what love out of it yeah no it is it is tough love and you know um i tend to reference uh my buddy duke diamond um on these shows a lot because he's one of the only other people that i've seen do this and i'm not saying other people don't it's just i've seen him do this you know and it, it really like put a lot of things into perspective for me, but I've, I've seen him go through like extended day or periods of time with no water to see which plant could handle it, you know? And that made me really think about it. Like as, as a, an earlier breeder um, of, well, well, what am I looking for here? You know, like, do I want something that if I baby it the whole time, it's going to be awesome. Or do I want something that's going to be awesome if I treat it like shit and then really awesome if I baby it the whole time. And normally my answer is number two. Yep. It's going to be stronger for longer. You know what I mean? Same way we talk about the soil. You know what I mean? We want that strong, those microbes in our soil that can survive that. You want plants that can survive that too. And when you have both microbes and plant surviving and thriving, um, you have a great system. So that's why it, it is big, man. Like you said, select for yourself. You know what I mean? And I have noticed... Um, you know, I noticed, you know, notice your phenos, you know, I noticed what these, um, I did eight, uh, 20 of the Mendo, Mendolicious and ended up right now down to 15, uh, females, but I'm seeing three distinct phenos. I'm seeing ones with like a that cross leaf pattern mm -hmm. where like the fans kind of do a overlap almost ones closer to the top. 
seeing one is with just a traditional kind of, you know, sativa look, kind of that long, kind of wide open look. And then one that just kind of looks a little squatty, you know, out of those three. Mm -hmm. My males both look kind of that sativa-ish, if you will. So maybe that that may be what I'm looking for then, you know, as I go, you know what I mean? Or maybe I get benefited by crossing the shorty with the long, you know, who knows? Well, and that comes back to the second question is, you know, like, what is the goal as a breeder, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you get to the end of your girl cycle and you say, okay, I have this girl that's short and stout and she's awesome, but she doesn't produce the sativa like high that I love from this strain, then breeding something that is tall and uh, lanky and has long, thin sativa leaves with her is going to give you the possibility of the next generation of that being a dominant trait. Um, and so then you have the opportunity to select again. And maybe this time you get the, uh, the pheno that you wanted. Um, and something that, that you also mentioned about putting the two pollens together um, and then going back with that, I think that that is a incredibly useful technique for seed expansion. So if say you have 10 Mendo perp seeds um, or Mendo breath seeds that, but you want to be able to look through a thousand of them. If you take the, uh, the pollen from the, the, the two male plants and you dust it on all of your girl plants and then you put all those seeds together, now you have an expression or you have a possible expression of basically everything you know like you took all the possible expressions from all the things in your 10 pack and you you expanded them to be able to look through them again um so you're not selectively breeding but what you are doing is giving yourself the opportunity to selectively breed um, in a way that you may not have had in the 10 pack in the first place and so something that um, i have done is i've gotten to be a better breeder um, or a better selector maybe, um, is that I very rarely open anybody else's packs unless I'm going to do a seed expansion on them and I'm going to do a, a, a second generation of looking through to see what, what all is actually in that, that pheno. Because like, I can see so much from five seeds, but what I can see out of a hundred of them is a completely different spectrum of what's available. And something else that's really interesting is that when you look at regular uh, male female seeds versus when you look at uh, feminized seeds you see different ratios of uh, possible um, phenotypes uh, when you're looking at feminized seeds you even if it's a feminized cross like let's say i took the pollen from nendo breath and i put it on to uh, you know uh, girl scout cookies um, the phenos that would come out of that if it was a male female cross um, would probably, you, you end up seeing a lot more female, uh, phenotypes than you do out of a feminized cross. And my, my guess for that is that because you're, you're eliminating the Y genome from the, uh, the cross itself and the, the breeding that you're only working with the, um, the, uh, uh, aspects of the plant that are connected to the X, uh, chromosome. So um, that just means that there's there's less options, you know, like the, the different traits that are attached to the X chromosome are going to be what vary within your feminized cross. Um, but in a, a male female cross, you have the ability to have traits that vary across the Y chromosome and traits that are carried mm -hmm. on the X chromosome. So um, you end up just seeing like a bigger, uh, you, you see more colors of the rainbow, I suppose, um, you know, in a regular cross than you do in a feminized cross. So mm -hmm. how you select from the, the seeds that you're popping can um, be determined by that. I mean, like you can, you can run a lot less feminized seeds in order to find the three or four phenos that you might find out of it than you would uh, running out the same number of uh, male female seeds right yeah uh, um so yeah. yeah hell of a good good answer so what so what i think i'm so with using your answer and then what i've already been thinking so i'm gonna take these males i'm gonna take, collect some pollen the the ladies that are running right now i was gonna touch the lowers on a few of them i was gonna test the lowers on a, you know hit them with a, all with a little bit of that male pollen then work through them and then rework through those seeds that I get. 
It looks like he dipped out. Yeah, I was just going to. What I a hell want, of a snapshot. Well, I, and I didn't want to interrupt your thought process, but uh, yeah. hopefully he'll pop back on here. He'll come back. But, yeah, this is this is the kind of stuff I need, Brian. Like, you know, when we get into certain things at certain levels, it's hard to just, you know, you don't just go Googling shit, you know, certain questions because you know you're not going to get what you want to you know, you're not going to get to the right spot. So having somebody with the experience to me, man, is vital. Like you, you, if you guys got questions, y'all need to get them in the, in the joint now, because, um, you know, someone with experience, you know I mean? I've seen some of the big, even some there, it looks like he might be coming back, but everybody's stuff isn't great. Y'all. I mean, it might look great. And what he said earlier about actually having to go through everything, you got to try all the plants to know what's good. You can't just say this one looks and smells you know, like donuts. So we're going to call it donuts and put it out there. Like it's got burn like donuts too. It's got to have that taste. You know what I mean? At the end. So, um, you know, this shit is, this is good stuff. Hey, I'm sorry. I think that's all right. Uh, we were just talking about like, we're just talking about the, the genetics that you're, uh, you know, I think more people are starting to realize, you know, the work that you put in. Um, you're a humble individual, so I'm going to I'm going to brag on you for a minute. Uh, the grow off has decided uh, the last two times uh, to choose your genetics because of how stable they are. Um, you know, I'm, the, I'm on the Marco and I are on the outside looking in on the grow off. We don't necessarily know how that works. But from the way I understand it, everybody gets to pick. Well, not every. OK, so the grow off picks your genetics. And then everybody gets to pick their growing style of how they want to grow those genetics and whoever grows those genetics in the best way that the community, that little community kind of judges, um, you know, they're the winner of the grow off. And so for you to be picked two times, and I, I, I believe I also heard that you're picked again for 2023. I wanted to talk about that for a minute um, so that a lot of individuals can realize that there's a reason why your genetics have been tried and true. Uh, for individuals like MJ and kind of the UGKs of the world, uh, putting, you know, putting real work into stuff, never having any of the um, accoutrement, if you will, of, of social media. For most of them, they could care less about it. But you're the one putting in that real work. And I think that's what most people realize is that the breeders are the ones putting in the real work. That's why you're able to answer the questions that Marco's been giving you on such a deep level, because you're actually putting in the work where some of these breeders kind of just you know, go through the motions, if you will. Um, and I wanted to highlight that and let's get into the grow up. But I, I think more people need to realize where their genetics are coming from so that they have a better canvas for their own artwork. Um, you know, I think that, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, we worked real hard at this. Um, and uh, it is, it is something that I take a lot of pride in um, and that, uh, you know, we, I, I've been lucky enough to be able to to grow and uh, and really see this through in the way that I have um, on the the scale that I've been able to see it through, um, and I think that's really cool. Um, and so you know, I'm I'm real lucky to do it. And I I just want to say that you know I don't think necessarily that um, that the I don't want to believe that that a lot of the breeders who are are maybe not putting in some of the work are is not because they I just don't think that they're at the I think there's different levels to this that's what I want to say you know I think that um, there is and there's places for everybody to be in that different level I want this to be something that's approachable to everybody I don't want anybody in the world out there watching this to think that they can't breed a plant or that they can't be a breeder or they can't do any of this if they don't want to, they can absolutely do this. You absolutely can. Every one of you guys can do this if it's what you want. If it's something that you want to put the time into and you want to do it, you can take it to any level that you want to. Um, the reason that we've been able to take it to the level or I've been able to take it to the level that I have is because I keep showing up and I keep doing it and I keep, uh, trying day after day and I keep, you know, accepting the, the failures with the, the successes. And, you know, I, I believe that, um, as people keep doing this and that they see successes in it, then it's going to make them want to level up anyway. And that as a community, you know, something that we can do, 
um, is we can start to uh, educate ourselves in a way that um, uh, allows there to be, um, you know, a, a way for this work to be appreciated. Because right now, um, you know, we're in a real weird place in the, the cannabis industry, the cannabis community, the cannabis world, um, where uh, we're suddenly in a lot of places around the world being given access to this plant that has been held from us for a hundred years. And uh, we're not being given education with that access. And one of the things that absolutely drives me crazy um, is that in every new state, um, there's all this brand new access to this, but there's nobody trying to, uh, not nobody, but there, there's a lot less people than there should be trying to educate the people who are coming in to use this plant and who are coming in to try and receive the benefits of this plant. Um, partially because you know, I think very few people have had the, the ability to be around it enough because of prohibition um, to, to really be able to make their own mind up. You know, it's hard to go in and recommend something to somebody else if you don't know what you like. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I would like to see a lot more education being, being put into this plant and a lot more uh uh, a lot more reward being put into the education of it. You, you know, um, I think that there's a lot of value in people making F1s. And I think there's a lot of value in people making F10s. And I think there's a lot of pe value in, in people just growing the weed out. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in people getting on profiles like this and talking about it and educating people and getting out there to talk about the things that actually matter in this industry. Because when you look at something as, as fragile as Instagram, you know, like I used to do digital marketing for, for a living, you know, pre weed. And, um, we were able to grow accounts in a way that we will never be able to grow in weed because Instagram can shut us down. You know, I, I grew my account to 17,000 followers and then got shut down the next day. Um, and there was nothing I could do about it at the time. Um, and there, there was no way, there, there's no recourse for it or anything else. Um, so, yeah, the, I think that that's a, a major downfall is that like a lot of our educational tools get censored. And, uh, so I, I want to, you know, quickly just applaud you guys for, uh, for doing what you're doing and, and bringing this, this out to the public and using your, your knowledge and your, uh, reach to get it out to people because it's, it's important. It's important topics, important things that we're talking about here, because it's not only the future of our weed, it's the future of our soil. It's the future of our food. It's the future of our world. And yeah, man, you ain't lying, Robert. Yeah. yeah, well, I wanted to uh, just we'll briefly bring on MJ and then we can obviously get into deeper discussions MJ. having him on. Yeah. Uh, but there's a reason I'm again why. I'm uh, sorry you on the grow off. I want to talk about that still. Yeah, we should. We should. <laughs> and hey, we're having fun. We're getting stoned. So if we're cutting off or we forget Marco, you know, just all good. Well, let's get back into it. But yeah, uh, I want, having MJ come back on again, um, there's something special uh, to this day for me. Uh, kind of going down memory lane. And I think there's um, a lot of talent uh, right here. And I think that if more individuals realize that you don't necessarily have to have a huge Instagram uh, to be anybody of any significance. I've also had mine deleted, Robbie, and I, I felt like it was actually a, a fresh, of, a breath of fresh air. You know, um, you have to obviously, for, for less of a, there's really no other way, I guess, to be in the influence of cannabis without being on Instagram. But once that uh, account is deleted, I don't know. There's something too where it's like, all right, whatever. You know, I mean, you it, didn't, yeah, you didn't get media. deleted. <laughs> you know, you're still yep. here. You know, yeah. So and, they can't and, delete the person. And you get to refocus on stuff. And I, I hope that uh, you know the karma for that seems to be like when that happens to individuals, the monetary gains seem to come 
uh, for whatever reason. So just shout out to that aspect. And I think, uh, you know, in time, especially being on these platforms, sharing what you know, buddy, uh, there's a lot of people that are going to want to grow your gear just because of the grow off. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but let's get uh, MJ on here. Uh, he's a UGK. If you know what that means, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody that I admire, somebody that took risks for a long, long time, and now is wanting to show his face. So I love that shit. Uh, good to see you, brother. Much love to you, nerds, genetics, big Rob's in the house. Love you, man. Love all the work they've been putting in throughout the years. Always been an inspiration to me. Oh, what's up, Marco and Brian? Sorry about y'all. You know I had to dump right in at my man because that's yeah. big what's standards up, for me. I know you're coming in with that big energy. We we got you. Come on in. <laughs> oh, well, Rob, Come man, in, let me we give you your it. flowers first, if you don't mind, man. The day I met you, what really brought my attention and my focus to what you were talking about versus all the big tents and the guys that were selling all these other things and gadgets and whatnot was your path. You could hear your passion when you talk about it. And that's what draw, that's what, you know, pulled me and gravitated me directly to you. Like this dude is real. Uh, and I remember talking to my, uh, my best friend, uh, shout out to Natalie Simone. She was like, you know, look over there and talk to him. Let's follow, you know, follow, follow him and let's see what's going on. And ever since the day I met you, bro, it's been an incline in success. It's been an incline in education and, and definitely love in the cannabis world. Appreciate you. Love you once again. Thank you for having me with you guys once. I can't tell you how much it goes both ways. I, I echo everything that you just said. You know, like, and it's so cool because I admire you as a grower. Um, and, uh, you know, like I've, I've gotten to watch you up your skills as a grower and as a commercial grower and as a home grower. And like, you know, the, the, it's been super cool to be able to not only watch you grow my gear, but also watch uh, your passion for growing really grow because of growing my gear uh, and everybody else's too. But like that, that's such a cool thing to be able to inspire somebody that you are inspired by. So, uh, you know, just big love. And that's all I want to say. But Appreciate it. Oh, what do you no. want to get Definitely into it. MJ, you want to kind of get into well actually hold on a second. We should back up a minute. We want to talk about the grow off because we don't want to lose track of sight of that. And I think more individuals might uh, understand why his gear has been so respected uh, amongst the you know the, the the UGK and type individuals. And um I think that that you know there's a badge of honor that comes with that, MJ. And I think there's a reason why individuals such as yourself uh, myself at, at one point in life, we chose genetics because we needed that shit to come through. There is no mistakes when you're when you're paying and, and making, you know, trying to do all this for for your family and pay pay the bills with this kind of stuff. So the genetics have to be tried and true. Um, and so let's get into that, Rob, and then let's get into you know why you were running his stuff as well, uh, MJ. So uh, Rob, let's get into the grow off part. And have you selected right, a strategy so yet for the first. grow off? Not for this year. Um, and so this year, it sounds like the grow off is going to be done a little bit differently. And it's not really, um, I, I should probably not be the one to be the spoiler alert on, on, or the, the spoiler on how that's all going to go down. Cause I just uh, was sort of given the update the other day. Um, but we are going to be working with them again in 2023. Um, and, and, uh, a capacity that is going to be very cool. Um, the reason, uh, so the grow off is super cool. If you guys don't know what the grow off is, um, you should really look it up. I believe it's in, um, eight, nine, 10 States right now, something like that. It's, it's, uh, all over the country. There's one probably close to you. The way it works is, uh, everybody is given the same cut. Nobody knows what that cut is. Um, they know that the the cut has been tested for HPLVD and is uh, inspected for, you know, pests and mold and things like that before they go out to it. But nobody knows what the genetic is, only who the breeder is. Um, and that is not, uh, um, that information is not given to them until the end of the time. So the, the competition is basically who can, 
uh, you know, really test their skills the best when they don't know what it's going to be. Like if you don't have four or five runs to find out what the flowering time is or what kind of food it's going to be, like, are you going to be able to show up and do this? Um, and then it's judged by lab results. So everybody is, is required to, to turn in a, um, uh, lab sample at the end of the, uh, um, at the end of the, the cycle. Um, on basically they have a, they have a window of time with which they, they can turn it in. And then the same lab, um, goes through and, uh, uh, tests for cannabinoids and terpenes. And then the highest cannabinoid, uh, profile wins and the highest terpene level profile wins. And so, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity, um, in, uh, weed, um, and like, and what, what people like and what people don't like. So this I think is a very interesting competition because it's not subjective. Um, you know, it, it's, it's based on, on lab results, um, which is maybe, you know, that people have their own opinions about that, you know, whether or not that's a good strategy is, is up for debate. And, you know, people in the comments go nuts. Tell us, tell us all about what you think about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that it's it's a, a fair way because it takes the human element out of it. And so, you know, everybody knows what they're growing for. They know that they're growing for the highest cannabinoids or they know they're growing for the highest terpenes. And if you're a real good grower, there are things that you can do to bring those numbers up. And it's not surprising to me at all that the same people win year after year. Um, but uh, so anyway, uh, the thing that's real interesting about that is um it's a competition and the first year of the grow off i didn't really know what i was getting myself into um and we've worked a lot on uh, breeding for stability not looking for or you know trying to make sure that you know when you pop a pack of f4s they're going to be almost all the same plan you know there's not going to be hermes or anything like that um but you know, for the grow off, I actually picked, I went a different route the first, uh, the first year that we did it. I didn't look for the most stable plant I had. I looked for the one that I thought had the potential to hit the highest numbers. Um, and that, that was met with some, some interesting reactions because some people did push their plants real hard and get them, uh, to show some intersex flowers. Um, but they had the highest terpene numbers that they'd ever had in any competition. And they had the highest cannabinoids they'd ever had in any competition. So when you're looking at a cannabis or like a, a cannabis competition, you know, and we're not looking at something that, that is uh, something that I would say, yeah, put this in your, your commercial grow and run this like every run next to your, in your most unstable conditions. It was more like, what can you do with this and what, what can you get out of it? And what can you, can you really show that you can be a, a real badass grower and, and push these numbers as high as they can go? And let me tell you, the people who showed up, showed up. They showed up in such a serious way. And it was so cool. I mean, granted, I don't know that this is a, a real number, but the, the total terpenes for uh, the one in Colorado, um, the first time they tested it was 8.1%. Now, for anybody who has ever tested terpenes, normally you see them in one, two, maybe 3% ranges. 8.1% are mythical numbers. And I, I'm not sure that that was like uh, an accurate. I want test. some of that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, we'll get you some. Um, but. Uh, you know, when they retested it, it, it tested at 6.5 or 6.7% terpenes. So no matter what, whatever they did brought up the number of terpenes in that plant to a, a tremendous level. Like even if the test is off and it was only 4% terpenes, it was 4% terpenes, you know, like that's crazy. So, uh, one of the things that I think is, is really interesting about the grow off, um, is that when given the opportunity to really shine, growers will really shine. Uh, and I think that's so cool. Um, but also it was interesting to 
to get some of the comments and come some of the feedback that came with it because it was you know maybe outside of what our our traditional breeding um has been for because the the strain that we released for that first one was hype train um which you know was is not part of my my breeding projects that was something i made as a one-off that i thought was cool uh, but the potential for it was insane and you could tell just by looking at the plant that if somebody really gave it the the um the attention that it deserved that it, it could thrive in ways that some of the other plants you know didn't have that potential for um but it, it was something that i mean we released like 10 packs of those seeds or something like that you know, I, I, the, compared to the hundreds or thousands of packs of Wody seeds that I have released, you know, like it, it's just a totally different, totally different beast on what we were looking for. Um, but it was it was a super interesting learning experience. And then this year in Oklahoma, we uh, put out another strain that I really like, uh, which is blueberry headband times Wody, and uh, we call that one Aretha. Um, and it didn't test in uh, super insane numbers um, like the hype train did, but it was overall, I think maybe better received by the, the growers in the competition because they had something that they could take back and, and put in their stable, you know, and the people in Oklahoma who, uh, uh, who won this year um, and absolutely, killed it um they got their their weed in one of the hardest dispensaries to to get into um with with that strain and like they have that forever now if they want it and like and that so was aretha. That aretha aretha yeah yeah nice. like as yeah. into aretha franklin or mm -hmm. yeah gotcha. um yeah i i'm a huge music fan um especially uh hip hop and uh, a soul and uh, Motown and things like that. Um, and Aretha Franklin died as I was uh, trying to, to name this strain. And, uh, you know, I, I believe my wife actually suggested it as a, uh, as a possibility and it stuck and it ended up just being something that was, you know, she's, she's a real boss lady. It really, uh, it, it really fits for you know a, a tribute to to such an amazing woman so nice uh, i like that well listen to this right quick all y'all caught the vibe so um we gotta talk about that thug passion we gotta talk about that thug passion i saw that out there too Oh man, you we're talking about one of my favorite strains. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's some of the best work that I ever did. Um in oh, the yeah. F one category for sure. Um we had a, a real we had a bubble cush that, that had been around Boulder for a long time, um, that we, we got access to. And Bubba Kush is a, a real unique plant for for those of, of us out there who have grown it. Um, there are two major phenos that you see out there that people call Bubba Kush. There's uh, what people consider to be the, the pre-98 Bubba Kush, which is a, a short, stout um, plant that takes a real long time to veg um, and produces these just amazing coffee, coffee chocolate flavored dunks. Um, and then the Katsu Bubba, which is a lankier, taller version of it uh, that uh, is the same, pretty much the, the same bud structure and flavor profile as the pre-98 Bubba. Very, very similar, maybe perhaps a little bit more fruit, um, but uh, um, has a totally different growth structure. And then, interestingly enough, uh, there's a, a third kind of variety that is out there from all of the S1s that have been produced with Bubba Kush over the years, um, from either plants that selfed themselves uh, under stressful situations or were purposefully selfed, like uh, 
what uh, you know Swerve and uh, the guys from Cali Connections did, um, and uh, those are also called Bubba Kush. So uh, when we talk about Bubba Kush, we're talking about these these three basic phenos that that show up in uh, in all of it. Like the S ones um, tend to show up as like a bigger yielding um, version of the pre ninety eight. Uh, for the most part, unless it was made with katsu and then it shows up as like similar to katsu. Um, but uh, so we're talking about the same plant, but it's it's like actually three varieties. So anyway, the one that we well, Man, it's almost like you know he's about to freeze up. He's about to drop a bomb and then freeze up. Man, that thug passion, man, that shit sounds wonderful. That bubble in there. Have you grown that brother's grow, MJ? Sir. Have you have you grown his thug passion? Yes, I have. Oh, I love thug passion. I love the coloring, the structure, and the high is amazing, of course. Boom. Um, I remember you I gotta touch bases when you guys said something about Aretha. You know his um on the um there he is. I'm gonna let him finish. But it says, dripping with class, this soul queen brings a sense of elegance to any situation. When you see her shining like a uh, a sequined dress in a spotlight and smelling, and it froze up. I mm. love the description drops I always gives. Gosh. Hey, that's a bad lady, man. Aretha will no joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Are right, you back, Rob? Can you hear us, bud? Oh, you, I muted you. Take him a second to it, get says, on. it says the mic's not connected yet. All right, MJ, did you kind of want to get more into, um, you know, why you were choosing him to, to highlight, and you, you know, why you're before before you came on? I was saying, man, you're you know, you're the, the best dude to have in your corner because you're hype trained and everything up, uh, you know. And then when the, some of these names come out and stuff, it's just, I don't know, man, it's just fun to see, uh, like you had mentioned, people that you've known for a long time start to find success. Yeah, uh, definitely been following for uh, like we said some time, and we all met uh, each other at the you know kind of the same events, and you know it kind of prospered into where we're at now, like you know eight, ten years later or whatnot. I don't know how long exactly it's been, but man, it's been great to see everybody you know uh, pick the lane they're finally uh, destined to be in and ride it out. When you get in your own lane, there's no traffic. You notice. But when you ride in somebody else's lane, there's Boom. always traffic. You go and get around and move around. It's like, man, I can't do what I want to do in your lane with you driving like that. But when I get into this left lane over here, it's a wrap. So that's so, a bar right there, man. Stay in your lane. It's a lot easier that way. Yeah, Rob, we were talking about some of your genetics, some of the reasons why MJ was, um, you know, chose to hype those so much. Uh, one of the ones that stood out for me while we're talking about that. Was the hype train crossed with the platinum OG? You were calling that the 1337 OG. Do you mind kind of explaining that one for me? It has all the. It sounds like something that I, you know, that I would be interested in. So, um, yeah, love, love to learn it about. It sounds those, like you know. this, you know, you do like that. Well, it, yeah, <laughs> that high end Italian. Certainly <laughs> should be something. <laughs> it certainly should be something you're interested in. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, so 1337 for those of, of you out there who are not in the 1980s or before um, is speak, which is uh, early 90s hacker speak um, for uh, uh, basically it was you use letters and numbers as code um, but uh, when I made the hype train uh, crosses, I had this idea that I was going to uh, uh, hype the planet um, thing, which was uh, an ode to the 90s movie starring Angelina Jolie, Hackers, um, which is a hilarious movie. If you have never seen it, please go watch it on YouTube. It will enlighten you. Um, but uh, we made that that cross the 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 lead og um it uh platinum og is a phenomenal strength um it is uh, 
one of the the expression that, that comes from so the one that we have is is um trying to think about where to start with this because the og story is very long for uh everybody in the community who has, has ever taken the time to try and try and figure out where this glorious train has come and uh, all the people that held it over the years in order to, to get it to where it is. Um, but in short, there's um, this original OG uh, that created a bunch of um, S1 seeds over the years. They created all of the other OGs. So the SFV, the Hells OG, the like, uh, the white, I believe, is also uh, amongst this area of things that are are all just basically self TKs. Um, and the phenos that came out of it, there are different things that came out of it. Um, one of the phenos that comes out in the S1 generation is this big yielding OG that is super frosty, um, but doesn't have any of the OG flavor, OG smell, OG, anything that makes it like really OG, you know, like it has sort of the, the bud structure, but it's, it's a bigger yielder. It, it definitely is a, a nod to, um, the, the super skunk parent of, uh, of OG Kush, um, or the, I mean, uh, they call it puck from what I understand is, is at least one of the parents of, of TK, um, which is a, uh, from what I understand, uh, and, and don't quote me on this because this is really something that the you know the Kim family needs to be talking about, and not me. But uh, um, the way I understand it is that um, it's basically three NLs, um, three Northern Lights that are crossed together to make this hash plant um, that that was called Puck, and then that that became part of of TK's mom. I believe it's also part of, of Kim Dog 91's mom, um, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, in the lineage. I believe they're both mothers there. Anyway, um, what came out of the next generation is um, all these different varieties of OGs that, that we have all come to love. Um, and uh, one of them is this, this big yielding, um, super frosty, uh, sort of tasteless, smellless version of OG, um, which still gets you incredibly high, like incredibly high, but um, isn't necessarily like it doesn't have the the sort of floral gas flavor that everybody loves. It's from the, uh, it's it's got its own like it was like tasteless hashy thing that comes from it. Um, but what's interesting about it is the way that it breeds into the next generation. Um, like literally everything that we have bred it to has become a bigger yielding, more potent, insane version of itself. Uh, when we made WEPA, which is a uh, um, Wody times platinum OG, that was the first uh, strain that I ever saw from us that hit something over 30% in another state. Um, and, uh, you know, Again, tests are not necessarily all about where it's at, but it's interesting because it's saying that like there is a high concentration of THC in this plant, and that breeds for it's a good reference like point. crazy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it's something that allows us to say, okay, well, this is for sure potent, but is it potent in a way that is going to be good for people? That's to be determined by subjective experience and, and coming back to us with feedback and those kinds of things you know like a test is never going to be able to tell me whether or not this strain heals uh their ails where heals what ails you um but uh it is going to say okay well this this has the the potential to be very strong in hash it has the potential to be um something that um, could uh, be a very powerful medicine if the the combinations of of all the cannabinoids and terpenes are working together properly. Um, but anyway, platinum OG is one of the biggest yielding strains that we put in our commercial gardens year after year after year. Like it, every time when we do the numbers of what the different strains come out, um, and part of our pheno hunt process. Um, back to what we were talking about earlier is there's two rounds of pheno hunting that we do. We do it and figure out good enough um, as uh, like 
all the things. Like, so we will we'll treat them real bad, get them all the way through, see what survived, what still produced good smoke. And then like what of that smoke is something that we're even interested in. And then we run those out against the rest of stable. So, you know, a good thing to think about as a commercial grower back to building your stable is when you find can set the bar with, like say you have an AK or a Blue Dream or something like that, that you, you can set the bar with, or literally any, any strain that you have that, that you have yield numbers on. That's where your bar is set right there. So when you bring something in, you want to be able to run capacity to be able to test it against the bar that's already set. So um, if you are saying, um, let's say that you have rows, um, which, which you run in your commercial grow, if you can do one whole row, that is a new strain that, um, has been already tested in your, your pheno hunt room. And you know, is a smoke that you like, and is, um, something that, uh, uh, gets to the end without producing intersex flowers and, um, isn't real prone to pests and disease and things like that then you can put it into your room in a, a, a commercial sense to see what it does in a commercial setting. So when you put it into that commercial setting and you feed it the way that you are with everything else, it, it has to perform at the same bar that you've already set with your stable or better, or it has to go. And uh, when you, you put it in and you can give it a, a real chance and run a row of them or run one big plant or run something that gives you a chance in order to be able to say, okay, well, compared to this Gorilla Glue that I have as, as my stable already, the bar is set at, um, you know, 10,000 grams per row. This one produced 12,000 grams. It was better and it was easier to grow. Well, suddenly the bar is up now. Now the new level of the stable is what you just brought in and everything that you bring in after that has to be as good or better. And that's, that's how we get better at this community. That's how we collectively breed something that, that is better for us as humans. Um, and it's how like communities did this for thousands of years before prohibition. That's, that's key right there, man. That is how we get better set that bar higher that makes a lot of sense man and i like that you broke it down to where you know in the commercial sense you know a lot of times weight is the key you know what i mean on that side but to me like i feel like we got a thing we uh, the, tell the, them they yeah, yeah exactly we got a thing we say it's called skipping rungs on the ladder like you might have made it to the top but did you hit all the steps along the way and i feel like just because you have money and you can open up a commercial facility, I still feel like there's value into run. You got to start somewhere and even running your own stuff and kind of creating your own stable so that when you do start that facility, you're not like you said earlier, just, you know, hunting, like you got to have something stable that you know is going to work, you know, on a, on a scaled up version, if that makes sense. So all, all key points, man. Oh, a hundred percent. There that is a huge, huge thing to being successful in this industry. And it, ha it has to be stable. It has to be unique. It has to be commercially viable. And it has to be something that, that you think is good enough to give to somebody else for them to keep coming back for it. Because when it gets to the end user and when it gets to the bud tender, or like, or let's say it gets to the bud tender and then it gets to the end user, we're talking about two people who have to be convinced that it's going to be a useful thing. You have to convince the bud tender first that, that it is going to be something that can help people. And then they have to be able to show the uneducated population, this is what's available for you to try. And if it helps them, they're going to come back and keep buying that because it helped them. That was the whole point. They came in to find something that helped them. They were shown something that, that could potentially help them. And then it did. That's the whole cycle completed. And so when we can get to a, a place where we're, we're really educating our consumers and we're really educating ourselves, um, then the level of care that we're going to be able to provide with this plant is going to be so much higher and so much more found um, of what we can do with it. And, you know, it doesn't, it's not limited to just the medical effects. One of the things that I find absolutely fascinating about this plant is that when the the when you apply the same um, 
the the same procedures that you do for uh, uh, trying to breed for cannabinoids or terpenes or or whatever. Um, you but you change the goal to say be fiber or uh, uh, you know material for plastic or, or paper pulp or uh, seed production for seed oil or seed flour. Um, now we're talking about 50,000 other usable products that we can be be breeding for. This is not just uh, um, one parameter of this. I mean, when when you're breeding for tomatoes, you're breeding for flavor, or you're breeding for yield or, or whatever. But like this plant has literally thousands of different things that we as a, a community could I to select for or decide to be interested in. And, you know, the amount of work that I can do is so little compared to the amount of work that we can do, you know, and uh, the amount of work that I've been able to do because I've had people like Michael uh, on my team uh, and really supporting the work that I'm doing um, has allowed for so much more expanse because I get to look at what he does in his facilities and I get to look at how, how, where he had his successes and pitfalls. And, uh, I get to compare it to the things that I did. And now I have two opinions and not just one. And when that's infinitely multiplied across this, this amazing, like sort of meta universe that we've created through social media and platforms like this, um, we're able to, to do something that like, science hasn't hasn't really provided a platform for you know like there there's not um there's not university studies on this in the way that there there need to be um in order for it to be advanced and so we as a community took that on and we did it and that's so cool uh, there's something really really interesting about this plant and this community because as a as a team we banded together and we made something that um, suddenly there is basically free access to this plant all over the world now after um, there being a hundred years of prohibition. I mean, we talked about 2014 not being able to find seeds. Well, I don't think there's a country in the world where you can't find seeds anymore. So, you know, like that's, that's amazing. Did we lose Marco? Uh, no, no, before, I'm back. And that before, is amazing. <laughs> before we get into more dialogue, uh, Rob, as usual, you're really uh, generous. And uh, we wanted to kind of take like a uh, an intermission, if you will, and give away some seeds, some of the genetics that, um, you know, you want to give to the community. And I always think when you're giving out like that, especially genetics that that people want, uh, you know, there's always something to that. Uh, so, MJ, if you want to uh, pop in here as well, buddy. Uh, just kind of wanted to talk about the genetics uh, that you're giving away, Rob. And then um, if London's uh, back behind stage here, uh, if, what, you know, what is the best way to do a giveaway? I don't know if I uh, know that. What do you think, Marco? Do you have an idea? Like, yeah, do well, I've seen pick a number. I've seen it done. No, we're going to stick to the, the question. The question is, you know, we have that question. So um, the winner then will talk about the string. Hey, All right, we ask the question now. We got to watch the chat now. Is the first person that we see popped up in the chat? I don't know nothing about anything else. When I when we see that person, we're gonna say he got the answer. All right. So the question I is, ask Robbie, something real quick. Okay. okay, go. Yeah, build that suspense. Go ahead. Who ever, Robbie? Let me just ask you this: the watermelon Pakistani killer. Why mm -hmm. does it smell just like watermelon now later? Like I'm in the, the movies oh, wow. just eating popcorn and I got to give me one of them now, ladies, baby. I put one in my pop every time. It's the exact smell and taste every time. Oh, Why nice. is that? Real quick. Uh, well, it's it's a unique combination of, of terpene is uh, found mostly in land Pakistani plants. Uh, almost every land race Pakistani uh, variety that I've uh, uh, well, so that whole mountain range um, in in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal area, um, amazing weed has come there. But what they selected for in those mountains, um, 
in at least one uh, particular variety, uh, which I, I've found a couple of different times, uh, comes out as a, a very watermelon pheno, and that breeds as a dominant trait going forward. Um, mm. So uh, the Wody melon, which is my version uh, of the, the watermelon Pakistani, um, is the the wody to that which adds a little bit more fruit footy but what really comes through is the dominant trait of the the pakistani um uh, uh just uh, the dominant terpene combination it is unlike anything that you see anywhere else um and you must every i've seen it show up in in other crosses that other people do it's the same watermelon candy you know like it, it calling it an alligator is the closest thing that you really you can do to describe it it's it, it's unbelievably sweet and when you bring it down into a dab um where you extract it actually with hydrocarbons um you know rosin is amazing but there's something that happens really inter in a interesting way carbons and especially this one um the that is so sweet that it leaves like an out on your lips um that you can like you lick it and you just ate ice cream and uh, you had watermelon ice cream it's uh it's it's truly phenomenal but it's because the content is so high michael Okay. Uh, that Thank is you. the uh, that's the the answer, and it it's unique terpenes um, that you don't see very often otherwise. Nice. That sounds. And the last damn little good. bit to that is there going to be a lucky person that's going to get some of the um, the Wody melon as well. Is that going to be in your giveaway? You know, so I hadn't really decided how we were going to to do this. But mm. here's what I think we should do. So okay. I think that we should give away three packs. How many packs? I just want to show issues. Hold on, you're uh, you're freezing up on us, Rob. We don't want to miss this part. Okay. Hold tight. Hold tight. You froze up. That's all right. Build a suspense. We got free <laughs> feeds. Free there it is. Pop back. There we go. <laughs> See packs coming. He's going to tell us how we're going to do the giveaway. Okay. It, it just jumped. We might be good. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, just like. Yeah. So, how about we. Okay. So, how about we do three packs? Uh, the pack that we give away will be the answer to Marco's question. Uh, second one will be. Be, I'm gonna let MJ pick a trick question. And Melon. And I think Brian should pick uh, a trivia question from any subject. And whoever gets that can get a pack of, let's say, 1337 OG. Oh, damn. Y'all lucky out there. This is gonna be nice. All right. So we heard the first one. The first one was. I'm going to ask the question. All right. My question is, and the first person that types it in that I see, and I'm going to say it, that's who win. What is the first one of Robbie's strains that we mentioned? What is the first strain we mentioned on the show today of his? Go. All right. This is for a pack of seeds. Uh, remind, remind the viewers which, uh, which one are his first. You're generous, first, giving away three packs. So yeah, what's going on this first pack for so they don't? Yeah. The answer to the question. All right, the answer to the what question. Boom. Is going Justin. Boom. Oh, I saw it. Where's my man? Let me see. Let me let me check my screen, guys. Chill out. Damn, it looks like Derek Nelson. Yeah, Derek Nelson, right on my screen. Woody. Woody's the name. That's 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 what you win. So Derek yeah. Nelson will get a pack of uh, of Wodies. Um, and, uh, uh, and he needs to reach out to you um, to get all that squared away, right? Yeah. So uh, can 
uh, can we get uh, an email into the chat um, that can be, uh, um, or can, uh, let's say, Derek, Derek, can you email me at nerdsgenetics at gmail.com? Can you write that on the um, our little board, Brian? Nerdsgenetics at gmail.com. And do a little post. Brian and I got, uh, we're working on our behind the scenes uh, mixing skills. So we're going to try to get that put up too. Yeah. So uh, for anybody who wins one of these, just shoot me an email. Um, I've got your name and what you're getting um, down. And we'll get it all figured out. Boom. There we go. Right there. I'll take care of you. Now, the second pack, I you broke up a little bit, so I didn't even hear what the whole deal is. So tell that one again, please. So I want MJ to uh, to pick a trivia question from any any anything. Um, and the person who gets it right gets a pack of Wody Melon. Now, is it going to be the person MJ sees first in his, on his screen? Or we're going to just let me see it? I'll do it again. I'll pick. I'll see the guy. On your, yes, yes. But I might not know okay. the answer because it's your question. <laughs> so you got to pick it. I have. So, MJ, listeners, what was... Say it again. Sorry. Can you see the okay. comments? So... Uh, They're gonna answer your uh, question over there, so you gotta watch and see. Who I can see, it it. I can see it, MJ. You right. just go with it, and I'll, I'll uh, pop it up there. Boom! I can see it now. There we go. All okay, right. so out of the what we talked about earlier, which of the strains had platinum OG in it? it was stable, unique. Uh, it was a big yielder. It was frosty. Um, See if anyone was listening, they can pick that out of there. Damn, I wrote that down too. I got that. I know the answer. <laughs> you got it. I took my notes. I took my notes. <laughs> There's actually two acceptable answers here. Exactly. Two, yes. Yep. All right, you seeing them? Let me look. Look what we got. Okay. Do I get um, it? No, 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 not yet. No, yeah. Not yet. Not Aretha. Not Aretha. I see Doug Passion. That was close. Aretha. I see not Doug. Doug. Yeah. Close. TK. I see TK no. in there. Boom. 337. Boom. Justin just got it. 1337. Let me. Y'all quick on the draw there, but yeah. All right. So congratulations to Justin. Justin. But there's one more. There's one more. There's one more. There's one more. Brad got it too. Brad got it next, right? With Hype Train. He sure did. Congrats Hype Train. Part. Hype Train. Bubba. Is that right, bro? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, uh, who who got the who got the thirty-seven? Because that was first the first right one, right? Justin, okay, okay, man. That is man, correct. Bro. Yep. And I hadn't seen the other part on there yet. So, Justin, uh, please email. Justin looks um, like it's going to be the lucky winner. Nerdsgenetics oh, at gmail.com. Try to find that here. Okay, Brad. Well, yep. you, you were second, Brad. You didn't get first. It's all good. Ooh, that looks great. Yeah, these strings all sound amazing, man. Y'all, hey, y'all grow them out, man. Shit, grow these seeds. I know I'm going to grow some when I get mine. All right, for uh, for my question, Marco. it's uh, yes, sir. What'd you say, MJ? Oh, yeah. Just tell him if he ever got a chance to get this right here. Don't slip. Okay. That was it. I'll get you on the All back, right, uh, back page on that. Well, hold on. Is your stuff available? Can we say stuff like Neptune? Is Neptune where you're? Because I saw your stuff and I was like, I don't know if this site's legit. Are you good there? Um, actually, uh, 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 Daga DNA Future Cannabis is one of the best places to get stuff. Okay, Peter's joint. Okay. Yeah, I support that. What's up? That's what's yeah. up. 100%. 
All right, sorry. All right, so uh, remind me, Robbie, what's the final uh, genetic line we're giving away? The answer to the last question, uh, Team 37 and B is the last one going out. Uh, and then you wanted me to, to pick a question. So, I, um, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia with the shirt that uh, MJ has on. Um, and I actually look back uh, through some old phones to find out when I, when I first met MJ. So I would put out there, uh, if you guys this should be pretty quick, uh, what year did MJ and I uh, meet each other? It was actually when we first started to find out what the saucy sauce was and, and talking to Sasquatch and a lot of these uh, older individuals. So uh, what year was that? Uh, please please uh, send that to us as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. mm -mm -mm. 25 and 58th. <laughs> Look at Chad trying to win. Uh-uh, Chad. <laughs> Endo Expo. So screaming, yeah. screaming demon cannabis got that one. Yeah, that's my people. What's got up, it? brother? Good All right, job. so uh, I, I would imagine you know. Please email nerdgenetics at gmail dot com um, so that you can get your seeds. And like uh, Marco and uh, everybody on the show is saying, grow them out. Uh, these you. are genetics that I think a lot of people wish they could get their hands on. You know, here you have the opportunity to basically, um, you know, find something that you might not necessarily have even ever heard of without, um, you know, watching this show. Uh, outside of jam, yeah, you can find a lot of gems with that. And London was even talking about your genetics are um, now in Canada as well. So that, that's yeah. you know, props to you, Rob. It's it's well deserved, buddy. I would imagine things are all over the world. You might just not know it yet. They are. The, increasingly all over the world, interestingly enough, you know, and it, it's super interesting um, to have somebody reach out and be like, you know, my cousin sent me this. I'm in wherever, you know, Columbia. Um, and uh, I'm growing out all of your stuff. I found you on Instagram. It's, it's super awesome. And it's just like the, the, the links that happen that, that you never really think about because um, I send out seeds all the time for various reasons, um, uh, either like venues like this or, or other giveaways that we do or whatever. Um, and to have some of those things be put into somebody's hands and then shared um, and have somebody down the line that like, you know, I never uh, intended to get seeds to get seeds, grow them out and then have some sort of, um, you know, life altering experience, um, for, for better or worse, um, it is a really interesting thing because it, it shows us, you know, how tight the community is and how far it reaches. Um, and, uh, it, as, as I go further in this and the, the more that, that we do it and the more that, uh, um, we get genetics out there and, and people grow the stuff, um, the more that I have people, tell me that you know people are familiar with the work that we've done that they've grown out the things that they were happy with something that that had happened or um it, you know it's 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 wildly uh, uh it's 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 really exciting to be uh to be able to be in a position where um the the work that you do from one place that that um, seems really small, um, can have a really, really massive effect when there's enough time and energy put behind it. Um, and I, I think that's one place that, um, you know, this community really shines, um, is, uh, we've been able to, to really spread, uh, the, the, the love with this plant all over the world, um, by, you know, sending seeds or, or sharing knowledge or, you know, sharing passion or teaching somebody how to take their first clone or teaching somebody what a, a female plant looks like instead of a male plant and allowing them to learn how to fish for the rest of their lives. Um, like there, there are so many uh, amazing things that come from us still having the desire to teach each other. Um, and I think that that is a, a really special thing about this, this community in particular is that you know it was so it, it was left in the dark for so long that 
it made people really thirsty for knowledge, but it also made people really innovative and really creative. Um, because the really amazing growers out there were not able to rely on the forums only or you know a grow bible or or whatever i mean we had resources for sure um and seriously big ups to uh uh jorge and uh uh the dj short and uh the the other guys um who put out those those early texts about um growing and breeding and like really came forward with what they they were talking about um and and you know said no this information needs to be out there i'm gonna put it out there period um and like that that took a whole lot of balls and a whole lot of work um and it's it's very it's amazing how many people it helped um but in order for us as a community to to really get to the level where we are today there had to be a lot more innovation there had to be a lot more understanding of organic soils and hydroponics at a scientific level um, of understanding nutrients and um, their sources of understanding the the science behind uh, microbes and uh, different biological aspects of, of what we're doing and how all those things work together. And, you know, this is another place where people like Jeff Lowenthal uh, really helped the community a lot because, um, you know, even though he doesn't really, I, mean, yeah, I feel like he's, he's sort of talking about plants in general more than he is maybe about weed in general. But he was able to bring science to our community in a way that was understandable, that could be broken down, that could be applied. And man, the weed got so much better. You know, like in any commercial or in any uh, hydroponic sense, um, especially when you're doing something like co like cocoa, drained to waste cocoa, um, where it's uh, it's sort of like a mix between uh, uh, yeah, uh, soil and uh, um, hydroponics um, any places where you can grow biology and you can you can further break down uh, the minerals and you can expand the amount of food sources that go to the plant the better the weed ends up turning out um, and so then when you take it to like an organic soil where basically the the plants if you build the soil right um, and you maintain the soil right um, have a uh, um, the ability to have like an all-you-can-eat buffet at all times of all the things that are going to be healthy for their growing bodies. Um, then the kinds of expressions that you see are are really phenomenal. And like, I always love um, uh, comparing uh, the plant to humans, especially since we're we're so close on on most levels. Um, but when you look at uh, hydroponics, I feel like that's sort of like bodybuilding. Um, and, uh, when you look at organics, it's more like Kung Fu, um, like in, in bodybuilding and there's nothing wrong with this and there's nothing wrong with hydroponics. It's just different. Um, but you look at it where you're trying to really like feed the plant as aggressively as you possibly can and work it as aggressively as you possibly can. You, you know, you're going to the gym 10 times a day and you're feeding it 14 cans of tuna a day and you're, you're really pumping it up. Um, and you get big, you get big freaking buds, huge, you know, that that are really massive and impressive in their own cool way. But, they're they're not nuanced in the same way you know they have a, a really heavy upper half um but maybe they're not balanced across their body and then i feel like when you look at at organics um and you compare it more to something like kung fu or martial arts um you know the that's a situation where you're looking at the whole body spirit and mind and everything else um, together in balance and organics is all about balance 
um, understanding organics is really about understanding your balance within the system. Um, you cannot treat it like hydroponics. You cannot treat it like you are going to have any real effect over the plant at all. Best you can hope to have any kind of effect on is the soil. And then if you have a good effect on the soil, then the soil will feed the plant and everybody will be happy. But um, when you're looking at, at a, a more holistic approach, at, at something where, you know, you're trying to feed the soil the best possible ingredients to be the best possible food source for the next thing so that the plant can work its metabolism in its most efficient way, then the kind of expression that you see out of that is, is a seemingly healthier expression. Um, you know, like there, there doesn't seem to be balance. Um, out, or there's balance within the body. It's not unbalanced. Um, uh, the plant seems to have a, a stronger uh, tolerance to, to pests and diseases and everything else. And so uh, you just see this, uh, a different approach that comes from organics, um, but one that, that tends to be, uh, the, the outcome of it is, is not swollen, but it's rich. Um, and I, I, I think that that's, you know, an, an interesting place to sort of start on uh, talking about, um, you know, determining, determining quality and uh, um, really uh, understanding the, the product that you're getting both as a patient and as a grower, you know, like, um, I think that like as a patient, every patient should know the difference between something that was grown in living soil and something that was grown um, in a flood and drain table. Um, and if you are really good at growing in a flood and drain table, then your product is going to come out excellent and the patient is going to be just as happy as if it was grown in organic soil. It just may have taken you know, more resources to get there. Um, you can grow a really good product, but we're not really talking about quality most of the time when we, we go into dispensaries and we're talking to bud tenders. We're talking about potency and we're talking about hype and we're talking about all these other things, but we're not talking about the flower. We're not talking about the actual medicine. We're not talking about how it was cured. We're not talking about how it was grown. We're not talking about the IPM that was used for it. We're not talking about the pressure that, that was um experienced during that grow and how that might have changed the the output of the plant because if you don't know whenever there's a pressure during the growth cycle that changes the 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 cannabinoid and terpene and flavonoid profile that comes out in the final product um and uh you know just like in peppers there are situations where you can make something more potent by being a bad grower you know, if you stress the plant out the whole time, you can get some really strong wheat, but it's not generally balanced in the same way as something that was healthy and happy the whole time. And uh, there's something about the, the way that the balance comes out in the overall profile of the medicine that really matters. You know, when you're, when you're smoking um, uh, the flower or the dab or whatever, and uh, you you get a a full body experience. It's different than smoking a, a distillate pen, um, which is a very um, single phase type of high, um, because it's only one compound. You're not you're not getting to experience the entourage effect of it, or all the beauties that all these other cannabinoids and flavonoids uh, you know play together with. And so, you know, as selectors, as consumers, it's important for us to, to try different things. It's important for us to find things that we like and then determine why we like them. And then it's important for us to talk to each other about why those things matter so that when it gets back to the people who are making these strains, then we have that input in order to make a better product for you. Um, or if you want to be a breeder, excellent, please sit down and breed some stuff and you know, determine what is going to make a better product for you and how you can contribute to the society too. Because at the end of the day, there's 
thousands and thousands and thousands of routes that this plant can go and thousands of projects that we can do with this. And no one of us can do this alone. And as a community, we can do it together. And, you know, if we get out of each other's way and start sharing more knowledge and sharing more uh, ability for people to, to get into this, then some of these amazing products that could maybe save our species or save, you know, our, our world or our civilization or who knows what, um, can be invented and created and put to market. And if not, then maybe they won't. We don't know. You know like it's hard to say. It's hard to say what will actually happen with that. But if we don't continue to like bring each other up in this community, then it stifles the creativity of the whole community. When, when, so we need more of these individuals to find success. And it seems like they do go after these holy grails, trying to hit home runs, where we're basically what I'm hearing from you today is if you're newer to this, you need to really hone in your skills of farming in general so that you're a fantastic f farmer at first and then getting into the breeding aspects. And if you can get into the living soil and maybe using that microbial world from day one, you might have a, an advantage to other individuals. You know, you might not have that skill set yet, but you have that microbial world to kind of buffer when you make mistakes. And so moving forward to that, how many different cultivars do you feel like you need to have a successful stable? Is it three? Is it five? And do you obviously need, you need like backup of these and that kind of stuff when you're more even on a, on a, I can't make, I can't fail type of basis. So what are your thoughts on uh, basically on uh, mm -hmm. having how many different cultivars in your stable to find success? You need one to find success. You need one outstanding strain to find success. Um, or you need three semi outstanding strains to find success. Um, you know, when you're building your stable, you will always find more success if you are consistently building your stable and you're consistently pheno hunting for something that is better. Um, the problem that uh, you will also remember, and uh, everybody who is a, a seed head will, will understand this, is there gets to be a point where there are some things that are unique for such completely different reasons that it's hard to kill them both. Um, and so then you end up with more strains and then you end up with more strains and you end more strains. Um, for a commercial garden though, uh, you need to look at the size of your room and you need to look at your, your potential output based on um, your regulations than anything. Um, for example, in Oklahoma, um, we are required to test every 15 pounds. So it's advantageous to be able to grow in 15 pound lots so that you can test 10 strains for the price of one, essentially. Um, so there, there are a lot of different factors that go into um, how you pick your stable and what you keep in your stable. Um, but I think the one thing that is, is universal is that your stable is not going to be good forever. So there might be some strains that will be good forever. Like, I don't, I don't think that we're ever going to be, we're ever going to get rid of OG or, or sour diesel or, you know, blueberry. There's like a handful of things that like, if you can still find them, they're still considered to be really good. Um, but for the most part, a lot of people have moved on because a lot of them are harder to find you can find a million gelatos now um, and, you know, a, a million wedding cakes. So um, the, there's a lot of things that are real popular right now um, that uh, the, the kind of flavor of the month, um, the, the things that people are interested in trying are, are going to continually change as, uh, as the, the market develops and as the the consumer knowledge uh really develops and the the ability to try stuff is increased um but i think that at the end of the day you really need to pick based on what your consumers are telling you you like and what you like to produce for them um because there's going to be a new flavor of the month every month 
um, and you can you can perpetually chase that forever, and there will be success there. But if you want to build a brand that, um, it, especially in this industry, um, consistency is is a, an absolute. And being able to produce a, a consistent supply of really high quality flour that is unique to your market um, is how you should build your stable. You know, you should pick strains that that people come in to buy, and that you like growing. You know, if you like growing them and people come in and you're the only people that have it, then you found the holy trilogy of selling weed, because uh, at the end of the day the market is set up for you that way because they're not able to go anywhere else have to come to you they like your product and you like producing it so like everybody is happy in that situation and the market will follow um but if it's something that you hate growing that that people come in and you know like they buy but only if it's really good well then like, is that something that you can be consistent with uh you know, there, there has to be passion in it for you as the grower as well. You have to enjoy growing the plant. And there's, as a commercial grower, you have to figure out how to find something that you enjoy growing and also is uh, commercially viable. Um, because if it's not both, then eventually it's going to catch up to you. And eventually it's going to, to tear one side down because um, everything has the benefit in order for it to, to move forward. So you got to pick stuff that um, is, is real good for you and real good for your people. And it doesn't have to be a lot of strains, but you need to be able to put them out consistently, whatever consistently looks like. Yeah, great points, man. You know, I always say grow. I like to grow the plants that, grow, that like to grow for me. You know what I mean? There's a something to that. You know, when a plant likes to grow for you, or you guys have a connection and, and it works out. Um, I do say that you know that's stable. You know, you got to constantly raise your own bar. You know what I mean? Things that you think are are great. You know, you got to kind of let someone else look at it and try it and raise that bar and see if um, maybe it's time to move on or try something else. Like I had a nice um, breeder's cut, you know what I mean? But I got an S1 out of that. I grew that. I like that better than the breeder's cut. So now I got rid of the breeder's cut. You know what I mean? It's just like it's all about selection. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, man, everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. I hope everybody is is getting something out of this because i know i am you know just as far as the you know quality in quality out you know what i mean you know what i'm saying mj you've grown this stuff you know what i mean and you know the quality so why don't you speak a little bit on some of that too that you know and and, and type in strains and everything. yeah and talk about how more of like I the underground definitely. part like they they want something different than the dispensary so you gotta gotta you gotta really understand that market where you live <clears throat> And, and definitely and being Denver, live, you know, living here in Denver where, you know, you can get weed anywhere. Um, it's always a good feeling to know that your friends and family can definitely come to town and, you know, partake and go on that. But they can also look forward to coming to your house to partake in what you've grown. And they're just as hyped about what you've grown is you're hyped about the person that bred it like like Rob nurse genetics. You know what I mean? So. Uh, it goes a long way to say um, consistency is big. Um, uh, you can go and you can go and grow seeds from anywhere. Um, that is your choice where you decide to get your seeds. But my goal and my journey when I found Rob, that's I said, that's what I'm going to do that. I'm going to go all the way with it. I'm going to be consistent with him. I'm going to do, you know, just run his strains. And I want to get to know him. And before I do that, I don't want to, you know, I want to learn one thing first. I don't want to learn all these other strains right now. I don't want to be consistent with what he's got going on. So that's why um, I should say our friendship and our um, uh, grow ship and um, how he mentors and, and gives free game out there is ridiculous. So why would I not want to be consistent with what he's got going on? We always say that too, man. It's just you're buying yourself time. Like, all that work that, that that Rob's put in, like all these years, that's buying me time. Now I don't have to do that work. I can I can reap the benefits of him putting in that and getting his genetics. You know what I mean and growing that out. So that's another reason. Like a grower always has big respect for for a breeder, especially when you hear 
that they're doing things the right way because as a grower you want some stability like I, you, you like a challenge but you don't want any surprises you know what i mean i want this shit to be right at least going in the gate i don't want any you know intersex issues because you know now you're seeding up your stuff so um yeah man you look for that consistency and i like that you said that mj like linking up like you guys are linking like you know what i mean you buying into what he's selling and, and and it works and and now you're it's just a cycle you're giving him feedback you told him you love that that watermelon you know and that now you know why it's in there like this is all just building that community man so i mean i think it's great man i, I think this is an awesome show appreciate y'all so keep it moving oh, yeah. well and i want to say like, that, that it, it... sorry go ahead I just wanted to get like MJ. I, I just wanted to point out that really more Rob that of your work, buddy. So, you know, the only business is repeat business. We've said that for a long, long time. Um, our little peer group, that was kind of like our mantra. Right. And especially when you're talking about in that gray market where you have to drive past a, probably a variety of different dispensaries, a bunch of different people that are also growing out of their basement. What's going to make that individual want to come to you? And what I admire about MJ is not only did he want to create that network for himself, he's a master at that. He's fantastic at networking and just being, but he also understood that I need to basically, I need to know this plug so that when I'm running his stuff, I know that I'm going to have something different. I think that's what a lot of people miss is they're always chasing whatever's the coolest thing. So by the time you get your grow up and running, you've been running through all your stuff, you find your thing. The community is off to whatever the next hype thing is. So, here you are, you know, holding all of this fantastic cannabis in your mind and everybody's past that. They moved on. So if you're focused in the gray market, you have to be actually one up on the community as a whole. You got to be at every single expo. In my opinion, the best way to do that is to go around and look at all of the booths. Who has the longest lines? Well, that's going to be whoever the hype individual is. If you don't if you don't know anybody's name yet, just look at the lines. And then I would like, like MJ is saying, he's going and he's finding the smaller booths when he's getting there. He wants to find out, you know, what is this individual about? And there's so much talent out there that that's how, in my opinion, you're going to be able to find uh, and create something for yourself a lot easier than if you are always chasing the newest shiny thing is doing the work, but finding the work that people have already put their, their heart and soul into so that, you know, that canvas is already kind of a hit. And as long as you continue to grow and you improve on your living soil skills, that's going to be a platinum hit, a gold hit where people actually respect that. And that's something that you're easily after when you're when you're trying to be a home grower or a commercial grower is you have to have a little bit of clout for people to want to put your stuff in your stores. That's just the way life is it's branding, however you want to view it. But in the in the gray world, that's clout. People want to people want to know that there's somebody else smoking your stuff. And once other people know that, then they're going to ride on that train. And that's just how people are in the gray market, especially. And I got to comment on Robbie as well. Like, um, like when we first started or whatnot, he invited me to come up to Long to Longmont. He stayed up in Longmont, had his own grow shop or whatnot. I'd come out, hang out or whatnot for a minute. And he was just like inviting me into his home. So for me, like he said, back in 14 and them years like that, you couldn't get seeds on nowhere. So for me to be able to say, I'm just going to drive up here to Longmont or to Wyoming or somewhere and grab some seeds and I'm coming back home. That's a win-win for me. And I know I'm going to get, a, a, I'm going to get a ton more information than I could have probably got on internet or YouTube for a whole day. Listening. I could have went and li- and sat with him and soaked up some game from him. I'd have been straight to go. So th- that's the reason why I pick, um, uh, someone that's been consistent in the game um it's not the 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 big shiny name that's out there but it's someone that was that had his passion and his story aligned in everything that that i was listening to and everything that was deep and that was in my heart um uh, a lot of the uh benefits of of cannabis and things that helped him out and um and running in high school and college and things like that so it's all about consistency man and love what you do, and everything should come out all right. Well, what about what about when you do get that one hit wonder, Rob? Like, you know, then what? You know, what I mean, do you just let the streets speak for itself, or do you kind of actively go out there and enter cups and try to get that notoriety? What's your thoughts on that? Well, that's building the business, right? It's 
certainly, you know, going out and entering cups and winning cups is a great way to, to gain notoriety in this game. Um, it is, it, it's its own game though, you know, like the, building the brand and building the breeding selection are two different games entirely. And uh, like you, it's, it's challenging because they're very, you know, building, uh, building your breeding collection and building the work that you're doing on the breeding side is a very slow game. It takes an incredible amount of time and an incredible amount of, uh, vision in order to be able to from the beginning and then try and make it happen and consistent enough to get to a point where you can actually get to a point of making it happen sometimes because sometimes it doesn't happen on the first try um and then you know when you're looking at, at building a brand in a lot of ways that's about being the loudest and about being able to get out in front of the most people and tell them, you know, like, this is the shit. You need to see it. It's awesome. Um, and then if you have a product that backs that, at, because there's a lot of great weed out, you know, that could be the next hype strain. But if you have both of those things, if you have something that's good enough to, to back it, but then you can also get out there and, and be on top of the world screaming from the rooftops, this strain is the next best thing. Um, then there's a chance of, of your strain being the next the next type thing. Um, and, you know, for a really long time, um, I was really not at all focused on what uh, was going on in the, the, the hype or the, the world of what was, was new in cannabis. I'm, I'm really still not. Um, you know, like, it, our breeding goal has always been the same. We've been breeding for hash the whole time. That's what we've been looking for. You know, my belief is um, hash has the most potential to bring consistent medicine to patients um, of all of the things. So whether it comes out in rosin or uh, uh, BHO or hexane or uh co2 or ethanol like they all create um different versions of uh, a medicine that can be utilized by patients um, and can be dosed more appropriately certainly by patients uh, um and uh what's interesting um where where it has sort of aligned in the last couple of years is that the things that are hype are also the things that make better hash so like suddenly we've been working a lot more with some of the stuff that is hype in the the industry um because it aligned with our original goal which was it made better hash and so when we were working with um you know the things that that were going to make better rosin um it's the hype strains not the the old stables that that have those trichomes that that come out and collect in massive numbers for fresh frozen it's the it's the stuff for the most part that we've made modern um in in the last few years that really do it um and there's there's certain traits that are being bred for specifically that are based on cuts that people find that wash in incredible numbers you know like uh, um, Strawn Anna, for example, was one of the first ones that like people started to really see like, well, this, this produces amazing rosin at huge yields. Um, and so uh, there were people that, that have been able to take things like that and make their, their whole, whole career on, on breeding for those strains. And that's awesome. Um, but suddenly that's the popular thing. And so it, it's really interesting to have kind of been in our own little hole for so many years and then all of a sudden be, be, uh, interacting in, in what is, is also popular in our industry because it's, it's aligned with what we were, we were already doing. I got a question for you, man. It's, it's one of those, here we go. I'm just going to throw it out there. So is the rosin and hash to flower similar to the skater and only knowing how to do tricks versus learning how to skate is that similar a hundred thousand percent 
a hundred okay. million percent even. Okay. Um, because you know, hash um, is an expression is the final expression of the plant. Um, and so, especially when we're talking about um, solventless, because it's when when we're talking about uh, hydrocarbon extraction, hydrocarbon extraction, um, butane, hexane, pentane, whatever, propane, um, is a brute force extraction. You're pulling everything out of the plant and then recollecting it in another vessel. Um, so you're you're dissolving it completely and then recollecting it and bapping off the butane. Um, in a solventless solution where you're, you're going to ice water hash and you're either going to ice water hash as your final product or you're going to rosin as your final product, you're talking about a process that requires you to have a, a, a more gentle touch with the plant. You're trying to finesse those trichome heads off of, of the plant in a, a way that doesn't break them, that doesn't destroy the beauty of them as a, a, a collected whole. Um, and so that in itself is a, a unique process um, of hat making um, that um, as a breeder is really unique because when we're talking about selecting for traits of, of the trichome itself, then we're we're talking about something that is a, a totally different parameter than we were we were selecting for when brute force was the the way to extract um because like say when i met mj um you know butane was was really like that was the new the new hot thing on the market at the time um and it was maybe not new but it was it was really basically becoming a well-known thing in Colorado where we were. And so we were fascinated with it. And uh, um, one of the things that that we were breeding for were, were things that hashed in a, a higher number. So we would send it out to uh, people that, that were really awesome, um, who know who they are. And uh, they they would do that that hashing for us and, and give us back yield results and, and numbers and things like that. Um, and those would allow us to breed for that. And now to tie this all back into what the original question was, you can't express fully what the plant is going to do, um, and get a good hash yield or a good hash final product. If you didn't grow the weed good first, um, if, if you grow the best flower in the world and you take it to, um, the, the hard time that is appropriate for hash making, then you have the opportunity to make the best hash in the world. If you don't, it's biomass. Thank as you. A commenter, <laughs> you know, so um, at, at the end of the day, it really comes back down to the farmer and it comes back down to the genetic. You know, if, if the genetic is has the potential to wash and the farmer, um, really like expresses that potential to the fullest extent, then the, the end product, the washed product has the potential to be as good as that plant can provide to the patient. Um, and you know, there's, the, there's a circle that, that is capped at genetics, you know, like, uh, I, I like to use the, uh, the example of Olympians in this conversation because um, when I ran cross country we had a, a couple guys on the team that were kids of Olympians and seemingly they were able to not train all season and still beat my ass um, and so when you look at it in the plant world the same thing tends to be true like if you have a really killer strain like something that you would put up against any other strain and you breed it into something else that's pretty good um, most of the time you're going to get some things that come out of the next generation that are killer. Um, and it may not be all of them. That's where the selective breeding comes in. But the, the likelihood that you'll get something really good in the next generation, if you started with something really good, is really high. Um, and the availability of genetics is sort of why um, there can be so many seed companies out there and all of them be able to have good stuff. 
because if everybody is being able to get the same GMO cut and the same wedding cake cut and, and we're all breeding with same cuts, then the, the potential for us all to put out the same, you know, good, good thing in that vein is, is real high. Um, but what's, what's unique about this plant is that there are so many different ways that you can take this, you know, you can focus on, uh, characteristics of land, land race plants and try and get a, a more holistic type of uh, high, you know, there's something that's really unique about those, those original land races and then the, the first generation of Dutch breed, um, that happened in the, um, you know, nineties and, and early two thousands, um, where they were in those, those land races and them together and finding out what that first generations of hybrids were, um, that, that are really, they have, uh, you know, compositions of different flavonoids and terpenes and, uh, uh, cannabinoids that, that have been bred out in a lot of modern because we were aiming for THC or we were aiming for whatever. Um, so, depending on what place you want to take with this, um, the, the, the plant allows you a lot of different roads to go down, but if you don't learn how to express the best expression out of the plant, you'll never be able to know how good your genetics are. Damn. Well said. One thing, um, one thing I'm doing is, as I'm saying, okay, growing the best flower I can for herbs and everything for my taste, right? And, and others, but, and then if that plant is good for hash, that's a bonus. Like I, I'm, and that's just, every, like you said, everybody's got to kind of have their own thing. So that's kind of what the way I'm approaching it. Um, and I think we cut off earlier. So I wanted to circle back to the, um, the Mendo, Mendo I have going. Um, so my, my plan was now that we talked, I think I'm going to hit, um, hit the breeder back. Just ask what are the characteristics he was initially going for, right? Then I think I'm going to dial in based on that instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. And then I'll probably take some of that male pollen and just touch some of them just to get me some more seeds to kind of, I want to re kind of work the line some more. Well, how's that sound? Well, it sounds awesome. And actually one of the best things that you can do is hit a bunch of strains because what it tells you then is actually what the male does. So if you have female characteristics are and have a bunch of different stuff, like you have one that tastes like garlic and one that tastes like lemon and one that tastes like cherries and you cross a male it and, uh, the terpenes are the same in category, then you know that whatever you cross that male to, it's going to probably show up as like a, you know, a less dominant side on the terpenes, um, than the female does for the most part. Um, but what you get to find out is what characteristics the male brings forward into it. Um, and so the better, you know, the female, the easier it's going to be to, uh, select a male going forward, because, um, when you do your first breeding project, you're looking at all of the, the different characteristics that, and you can assess, did this come from mom? Did this come from dad? Or did this come from a previous generation? And uh, the better you know the original parents, the easier that will be. Yeah, boom. And that's why it takes so much time. So that's like for me, man, you know, home grower, got time. This is just going to be a slow, long process. Try seeds, try keeping one I like. And that's all it's ever been for me is. But the difference now is that I've got these proven genetics that I have access to. Whereas before you were relying on what could you get shipped in from wherever and hidden in what compartment? And, and if that was any good, you know what I'm saying? So since, I mean, these last few years have really been wonderful. Like, I mean, and people out there, if you're just starting growing, and I think Rob had loaded, alluded to this earlier, like it's, it wasn't easy. So you guys are kind of spoiled. You have so much to choose from. So take your time and really find a good breeder that you like, find genetics that you like, and you can really dial in, find strains that, that you need like if you're really down low person find that upbeat strain you know fine and if you're the opposite find that opposite strain it's out there now and there's people that can tell you you know and 
back then it was, it was like y'all said, you know, you just took whatever he had or whatever the guy had, you know, like, what do you got? Oh, you got some more of that? No, I don't have that. Damn, what you got? You know, like when they're asking for the other stuff, you know, you're going the kind of the wrong way, uh, <laughs> you know, with your growing. So always keep them excited. Like, oh, no, but I got this. Oh, yeah, I like that. You know what I mean? And always keep that keep that uh, stable fresh. You know what I mean? Keep that keep the input in from people because I, you know, like I've had strains where I'm like, I don't even care that care for that, you know, whole bucket of it. Like I don't really care for. It. Well, let somebody else try it. Damn. They love it. Now it gets hot. Like, all right, cool. Y'all love that. I didn't work for me. Appreciate y'all. So that kind of gives you more, you know, share your shit. You know, if you want it to be out there, let, you know, let people know what you got. And let me say this to you, Marco, since, you just brought that up when you know you have those strains you're like man i grew six plants of this and then they saying shit man like this ain't really doing up for me but like you said it may not be what it's doing for you, but the end product is going to the patient what is it going to do for them maybe it didn't yeah. do so good for me with sleep and maybe for anxiety or this and that but it right. worked wonders for them that they're shine they're a shining star i work they're on time now they're alert yeah. they're uh, energetic their mood has changed they're positive now and you know exactly it ain't always about them. us right it ain't always about just us but what i do keep is going to be the best you know and always that that's one thing don't don't cut your quality um you know because i do have you know like my dad's like man I, no man that stuff too strong I, where's that other stuff where, is, <laughs> where them trimmings at i want them trimming, yeah. you know <laughs> the shake <laughs> and that's real talk you know and you know one man's trimmings is another man's gold. So, you know. Right. Because it's, it's the same product. It's like, what is the, where's the convenience? Do you want to break down a bud or do you just want to see a nice little bud? Because the same thing is going to break down into. There you go. You're going to get, you're going to get, you get yours. He gets his. <laughs> there you go. Everybody's happy with the same product. Wow. Definitely. I was working That's with big. this uh, company in Oklahoma and they had, they're pretty well funded. So they paid for this. Um, research, if you will, for people that were that were coming in. They had a soft opening. They were trying to find out what people wanted. Uh, they had four corners, so like one section would be for flower. I, I thought it pretty well, pretty well thought out uh, for what they were trying to do, right? Yeah. So that they could kind of see, like, all right, this these certain individuals like flower. These certain individuals like dabs and all this. What they found was, at least for their location and the way that they were representing themselves, is that the females were making most of the purchase decisions for the household, which mm -hmm. meant that you would think that these OGs and these heaviers were, would be what individuals wanted, but that individual wasn't there making the purchase. It was mm -hmm. the, the wife of that individual that was making the purchase. So the fruity stuff shot up. The fancier stuff that might not, you know, the shinier stuff that might not necessarily be the highest THC, um, you know, ladies, individuals, they, they like that kind of stuff. So when you're going into the commercial aspects of things, I think you need to also understand your market. And from a dispensary standpoint, you need to realize that for a lot of households, you know, the husband doesn't he doesn't have time to go to make that purchase. So the, the female aspect of what they like seems to impact overall sales. Uh, at least, at, you know, a few dispensaries. And again, this place was represented as high end. Mm -hmm. it, it would have been some place that I feel like a lot of nine to five individuals, male and female, would feel comfortable going in, asking questions. So they might have had their own little niche. But what I learned from being a part of that um you know, little exercise was that it's paramount in the gray market for you to do the same thing. And you have to realize that like, it doesn't matter necessarily what, what you like. Like if you're putting out um, fruity, you know, stuff that you and I necessarily um, want to put out, but it's selling quickly and people are coming back asking for it by name, then that's something that is, I, I think in my opinion is silly to, almost like your ego is going to determine your pocketbook. If you're, you're, you're I'm on to the next thing. I don't grow that anymore. I saw that a lot of times here in uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Denver, MJ with like uh grapefruit and stuff. Some of the, the blue dreams, some of the older stuff that necessarily wasn't around anymore, but the nostalgia of it, like uh, San Fernando Valley, some of the stuff that it, you haven't heard of for a long time. But now if you have that, boy, you got that stable again. So think about all of those things, all that nostalgia aspects uh, you don't necessarily have to have the newest stuff to have the stuff that uh, a lot of people with with monetary means want. 
And if they can smoke the stuff that reminds them of their youth, uh, that was always something that I felt like our peer group uh, would focus on. The Durban Poisons, the Blue Dreams, the Golden Goats, yes. you know, the, the Gorilla Lines. Glues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And now, yeah. like you said, man, it's, it's younger generation in this cannabis community. Um, and it is controlled by, uh, I should say, more women than men, I should say, when it comes to, like you said, when it comes to sales or whatnot. So um, I don't know, man. It's it's kind of based on what you want, what's going to work for your body. Uh, Rob probably summed it up. Well, I'll give you anybody. a realized example of that, too. Like, as far as the women goes, last year going to that co- that competition, I won a free entry to this uh, to this cannabis cup. And so I ended, I was I had two strains. I wasn't sure which one. And so I kind of was weighing it back and forth. And I so I let my wife smell. And she was like, oh, this one's nice. I like this one. And she smelled the other one. And she said, oh, I don't know. That one smells um, like harsh cleaning chemicals. I don't like it. And fuck, that's the one I should have entered. You know what I mean? I entered the mild one. I went that way. Um, but uh you know it, you gotta think about your audience bro you know what i mean i should have went hardcore and entered that that hard gas chemical uh like my gut told me but i didn't so moving for moving on <laughs> well you know it, it kind of does something exactly. that is interesting is in uh like we used to do a people's choice award um at this little competition that we would do up in longmont and uh the ones that won the people's choice award were almost always the the like strongest fruit and the ones that won the reviewed one were almost always the gas um peers like that gas (laughs) well you know i think it just one second rob he just basically co-signed what i was saying those people paid for in oklahoma where it's the it's the heavy fruit that that's selling even though that might not necessarily be what you want to grow so rob you Exactly. You fell off, but we were talking just about that. So you basically just, I, I love to see that when we're, we're putting out information that I think a lot of people can benefit from and learning those things on the back end is how you make money. Mm-hmm. Well, and to me, some of those original strains are the best things that like I have ever found. Like I, I've never been able to make anything that was better than TK or original OG. Like I, I can't make that better everything that I breed with is different. It's really awesome. I'm smoking TK right now, two days. Um, but, uh, I can't, I can't make it better. It's, it's as good as it gets. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's something that is always going to be in my stable. I always try and keep like four in three different places just to make sure that we never, ever lose it. Um, and, uh, that's part of keeping the stable too, is, is believing in the plant that you like. Like I love blue dream. I don't care what anybody else says about it. I love blue dream. I'm just going to go ahead and say it over and over again because I freaking love it. Uh, I love growing it. I love smoking it. I love smelling it. I love all of the parts about it. And I love that it is awesome for being a moneymaker too. Um, but you know it's gotten a whole lot of hate for a whole lot of reasons over a lot of years and i kept it and now a lot of people wish that they had it so there you go that's a very good point it's almost like sometimes you know how like the fashion industry shit repeats itself every few decades kind of seems that way with the cannabis where like you know 10 years go by now everybody does want uh the the classics and nobody seems to have the true classics they have some kind of watered down version of of stuff that people probably really could have uh made a difference with and um you know again you shouted out duke diamond um you know that's somebody that i feel like has a lot of those classics uh, when he was unfortunately, um, you know, away from us for a while, I reached out to Rob and I just wanted to, to highlight that, that he was the first individual that got back to me and came heavy with the seeds to raise money for him. So I, I just want you guys to realize that Rob is not only looking out for the, you know, the little man as well, but he's helping individuals when, you know, sometimes the the community can make a difference. And he made a difference uh, that day for, for what we were trying to do. Uh, so, Rob, I, I really appreciate that, man. I mean. Duke's one of those that you, you want, you, you know, if something happened to you, you just kind of have to help because you know that he'd be helping on the flip side if something happened to you. Well, he's been an amazing mentor to me um, in a lot of different ways. You know, he's somebody that I've always looked up to as a breeder. 
um, and as an organic grower. Uh, he's he's incredible at both. Um, and he, uh, I got the privilege of knowing him. Um, and uh, he really, uh, you know, lit a, a whole lot of fires in, in the creative side of breeding for me. The conversations that we had um, really put me down roads in both organic growing and in uh, breeding that, that I'm still traveling today. Um, and so like, you know, there's no way I can ever thank him for the, the way that, uh, that he showed up for me all those times, you know, like best I can do is try and help him when he's in need, you know, and, uh, just shout out his name and, and tell everybody in the world that like, if y'all don't know who this is, this dude's the, the truth. Um, go follow Duke Diamond or it's the real Duke Diamond now on Instagram. Um, he's partnered up with another dude who is an unbelievable breeder that nobody knows about named two. Um, and, uh, like the two of them are going to create some stuff that, that has the potential to be really powerful medicine, really, really unbelievable stuff. Um, and I think it's interesting that you brought him back into the conversation because he's um, somebody that that I really looked up to because of the the collection that he had done over the years. You know, not only was he able to get some of these real rare stuff, uh, real real rare strains, um, but he he was able to keep them, which is an enormous feat. If nobody has ever tried doing that, like let me tell you. The amount of time and energy and effort and money that goes into keeping a stable of moms is unbelievable. You would never guess how much it actually takes. Um, but the reality is that it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work. It's a tremendous dedication to the community. Um, and because of it, there are things like Kim 91 that are still around. There are things like TK that are still around. There are things like Sour Diesel that are still around. There are things like Original NL that are still around because people did that work and God bless them for it. Because like, if they hadn't have done that work, then we wouldn't have it today. Um, it would have gotten completely stomped out by the government when they wanted to put us in prohibition. But we as a community said, no, these are special. We're going to keep these. And we kept them hidden underground for years until they could come out. Now we're fruiting or we're reaping the benefit of all of that work that all those people put in, that many people were incarcerated for, that people lost their lives for, that people lost their freedom for, you know, like every person out there who is investing in a weed company, you better be doing something. If you weren't part of the, the, the process before this, then I hope you're doing something to help people who were, because at the end of the day, a lot of people put their lives on the line so that you could drive a Bentley um, or whatever it is that you have found success for in this industry. Because, you know, if it was you, then that's awesome. Good for you. You deserve to reap those benefits. If it wasn't you, then you better help out somebody who lost their lives to this because you don't deserve to just reap those benefits and not pay respect to the people who kept this plant alive. So. Amen to that, brother. Especially individuals you know. And uh, when, when you mentioned that, I I'd love to highlight two for that, for that reason. Um, you know, not an, I don't think a lot of people might necessarily know who that is, but he was the, the brains behind Charlotte's Web. And uh, yes. just like a lot of stuff where, you know, the original artist, if you will, canvas creator, uh, they, you know, allegedly other people took that from him. Um, you know, he's, he's willing to tell his story, I would imagine. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fucked up world. And Colorado has so many bright minded individuals, uh, even in the kind of the two world, the MJ world, where I, I hope that more people start to see that a lot of the real medicine is coming from just a few individuals. It's not like there's just um, all of these bright minded people until recently, like beforehand, there was some people that were just kind of like known because they were putting out medicine like that. And two was one of them. So do you mind kind of sharing a little bit? I know you know more than me about, about that individual, but uh, his, his moniker, if you will, is, is definitely, um, you know, it's well known here in Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I am not the right person to tell his story, um, for sure. 
Um, but I, I will say that um, the legend has it that, uh, and I've met the dude, he's, he's the nicest dude. Uh, but uh, legend has it um, that uh, he created uh, this strain called, uh, I believe, Wu is what, what it was, was originally called. Um, and there was a nefarious act of some sort um, that happened when there was a parting of ways um, in which that this really incredible strain, which later um, became sort of became Charlotte's Web, um, uh, got renamed to R4. So there, there are a lot of people out there um, because the, as I have heard the story, um, they couldn't read the tag and uh, they thought Wu said R4. So um, that was that was what it got got put out as um, for for a long time. Um, and then that strain um, tended to produce seeds. So from what I understand, Charlotte's Web was a seed from that original R4 strain. Now, again, this is not my story to tell. Um, I hope that you can have two on the podcast to, to really tell this story because it's, it's worth hearing, especially if anybody is interested in, um, CBD or, uh, um, you know, interested in, in breeding rights because there's, there's, there's a lot to his story that is worth is noteworthy. Um, but Charlotte's Web um, is the basis, basically, for every CBD thing. I mean, like there, there's, there's a little bit that that's not a, a a totally true blanket statement. But the reality is that almost everything that comes from the CBD world came from Charlotte's Web somewhere along the way, or or R four more appropriately. Um, and uh, so you know, his influence on, uh, the, the nation and cannabis, uh, in general is so immense. And the fact that nobody knows who he is or very few people know who he is, um, is really unfair because his contribution, um, with just that strain alone is, is so incredible, not to mention all of the other work that he's done. And like, I, I know he's done a tremendous amount of work in, in CBD and other cannabinoids and, and um, doing stuff to, to promote, you know, real medicine for real patients. Um, and so, you know, big ups to that dude for sure. Cause he's, he's been at it a long time and has been persecuted, you know, in, in a number of ways and, and deserves to have his flowers as well. Amen. Yeah, well said, man, because sometimes people might they might not even be seeking recognition for that. But I think more people need to realize that uh, the medicine came from the, the underground world, from the gray market. That's where the real work was being done for a long, long time. And um, two and, and people like him uh, deserve to have a, a small spotlight if they don't want one and then a bigger spotlight if they do, just so that others can kind of pay those respects and realize that. Uh, it took a long time to like Marco was kind of getting at. It took a long time to to get where you can just go and get a pack of seeds and grow and, and put it up on Instagram and YouTube and not feel the bit about anybody's coming after you because you're such small time individual that it doesn't matter. Back, mm -hmm. you know, even in like 2014, I mean, I don't I don't necessarily know if I was showing my face back then, MJ. You know, I mean, there, there was still too many things that were going on where it wasn't it didn't make sense to do that, where you could at least you could put out material. But why would you want people to know who you were? Uh, so oh, well, a lot, a lot has come. You know, and a, someone else that I want to mention in that vein who is is not, um, you know, attached to to those guys, but was also doing, you know, a lot of really interesting work in those early years in Colorado was um, uh, the guys behind uh, 303 Seeds. Um, and I, I don't know where they are in the industry or how they want to be recognized. So I'm not going to put their information out there, but I am going to say that they also, um, did a tremendous amount of work to bringing CBD to a, uh, um, a consumable market. And I'm not sure that they, they got the flowers that they deserved for, for that effort either. So. But they're the guys behind Spectrum 65 and uh, or Spectrum just in general and uh, the um, and the CBD side and then um, so many awesome 
THC strains like more than than I could count. And they also were one of the first people in Colorado to try and use the metric system um, and the the legal cannabis market to produce seeds within the legal cannabis market. Um, and so that in in general is is a really unique thing because they they sort of tried something everybody else was scared to do. So. Yeah, Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to recognize the people that have done it before you. And I think if you don't do that, then, you know, shame on you Uh, because, you know, I guess you don't really understand what it took. Uh, There's a few questions here that we could kind of go over. And then out of respect for everybody's time, we're going to try to keep these dialed in uh, to no more than three hours. Uh, So I wanted to kind of get to a few of these questions. Uh, the first one was from Tyler, and um, I think this might take a few few minutes to kind of talk about. But he says it might be uh, Tyler from Grassroots Fabric Pots. Might be controversial subject, but I've learned the hollow stem is a nutrient deficiency. We can see this in sap and tissue testing. Calcium boron foiler uh, sprays fit it in. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, he's not wrong. Um, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, um, and there, this is a part where like the breeding is, is art. Um, and you know, maybe the, the science, like uh, my understanding might not be well or strong enough in this subject in order to really, um, explain what's going on here. But, um, I believe that that is is a hundred percent true that it is a nutrient deficiency, but it seems to be a nutrient deficiency caused by extreme growth. So you know, like in similar uh, instances where uh, one plant is growing slower, it's not nutrient deficient in the same soil, uh, but something that is growing extremely fast and is showing amazing vigor um, will be nutrient deficient faster um, in it. So it's not something that we look for um, in the clone generation. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier um, was that like when we get to the clone generation, for the most part, having hollow stems is not a good thing because as Tyler is mentioning, um, that's a situation where you're not able to feed the plant enough. Um, But it's something that we look for in our seed generation um, because we're looking for those signs of vigor. And so since we put them in a situation where everybody is fed the same thing, the ones that are are hungriest fast um, is a sign um, of something that we are looking for. So um, it's not a plant health thing in that situation. Marco or MJ, you guys want to add to any of that? Yeah, it makes sense, man. I noticed that I do notice that um the plants with the hollow main stems at the clone tip level, that hollowness is not there. You know, I do notice that. And um, yeah, because I don't um yeah, I, I can't remember the last time I took like a clone with a hollow stem, you know what I mean? I think they like, almost never root. Right, exactly. Yeah, it would be worthless. But yeah, so like you're saying, I think like you said, in that seed generation, like right off from seed, I get that. And I like that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Plants probably outgrowing the amount it can even take in of, as far as those deficient uh, nutrients he mentioned, calcium and boron. Yeah, I mean, if they're deficient in calcium and boron in the first three weeks um, or, or a veg, then they are eating like crazy. And that's awesome. So, you know, that's something that we're looking for. And um, I, I think that it, it's just one of those things that, that uh, we noticed originally when um, we were doing all these pheno hunts of all of these different seeds is that a lot of the things that we kept were the things that were hollow when they were, they were coming up. And so, you know, like to go back to the art part of this, that was a place where, you know, just our observation was telling us that this is going to be a stronger plant over time. Uh, but how I have justified it through science is what we just talked about. So um, I, I I have learned that that, that is a, a, a deficiency. But again, we don't really uh, we try we only use that technique in the, the seed stage and not in, in any clone generation or anything where we're mm-hmm. trying for plant health. MJ? So later on, we can't be is it safe to say we could look into it uh, both ways and say it's not 
uh, necessarily a deficiency or can we kind of look at both ways and say, can we rule something out to say it's not a deficiency versus? No, you know, I think it hollow. is a deficiency. I think that, that that's a hundred percent right. And just, and for exactly the reasons that we were talking um, with Marco about is like, you will almost never get a hollow rooted clone to root. You know, like okay. if the, the stem is hollow and you're cutting off of something that's growing really fast and it's hollow in the middle, um, then that clone is worthless. Like it, you can put it in, but almost always they don't root. Um, sometimes they will in an arrow cloner, but um, for the most part, it, it, those are the ones that die off first. Um, and then after they've rooted, if they do root, they seem to be the weakest ones. So, you know, if they started from a deficient plant, a plant that wasn't healthy, then like it's not going to make a good clone in the ne in the next generation. Um, and you see that with all sorts of other deficiencies. Um, and now when we're, since we're running a clone business, that's another like aspect uh, of the game where we're, we're learning so much more because of the, the way we've interacted with commercial, commercial cannabis. Um, but this is a whole nother part of it. Anyway, when you see deficiencies in the plant, like if you're seeing purple stems, if you're seeing small leaves, if you're seeing all these things that are, are not showing healthy growth, um, including, you know, big fat hollow stems, um, then you're going to have a hard time with your clone success. And so, um, I, I think that, that Tyler's uh, like a hundred percent, right. Um, it's just, we applied it in a different way. Okay. And when this happens, is it, is it safe to say we should just go ahead and get rid of it now or. No, you should you feed it a uh, lot of first time or. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that when you're looking at it as a grower's perspective, like, um, you know, like when you're trying to, to produce the best flowers you possibly can, then you want to be able to baby it. I mean, if it's in the first pheno hunt run where you're just trying to figure out what you have, then that's uh, not somewhere where you need to, like, try and cater to that plant. But if you're going to put it in your stable and you love it that much, and you're going to be growing it a lot, then you need to figure out what it wants. And you need to be able to work in harmony with it. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that that's a place where understanding that, okay, if I feed it more micronutrients, if I feed it more calcium and boron, and I feed it, um, you know, micronutrients in general are often lacked in, in calcium nutrients, but or in uh, uh, cannabis nutrients. But that's a whole nother topic that we could go and talk about for hours, and so we're not going to. But... Um, in those cases, if you can determine, you can use that as a determining factor as, as a grower and say, oh, I'm looking at this hollow stem. I probably need more micronutrients to, um, you know, uh, change the growth pattern of this so that it gets a, a more efficient uh, 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 delivery of, of each of these, these nutrients that it needs, um, which are, are frequently based on a... a, a inadequate amount of micronutrients, um, which is another reason why organics is awesome. But, um, anyway, the, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. Like if you can be a grower and you can, you can determine what the plant wants by what it's showing you, then you're going to be a better grower. And then you're going to be able to show a better expression of what it is and you'll make better hash, you'll make better flour, you'll make better medicine period. Uh, Hippie Zombie wants to know why don't breeders put on the uh, F and then the number on their seeds? Because they're almost always F ones. Boom. Uh, Ninety nine percent of the time. Ninety nine percent of the time they're F ones. If they're not F ones, wow. then the breeder probably puts it on there. Um, you know, and the the reality is that there's a lot of work that goes into taking a, a strain to a next generation. Like when you say, oh, I want to make F2s, that sounds simple, but you just committed a year of your life and a year of your resources and a year of your growth space and a year of your everything. If you want to go to F3, that can... Man, when he drops the bars, that's when they cut him off, huh? Can you guys Cold hear him? Cold bar. Uh, no. Thank you. That's because everything he says is a bar. <laughs> everything he says is a bar. Wow. It's crazy. 
but he's humble enough to where it's like, all right, man, I'll sit here and listen to you. Cause sometimes people have that knowledge and it's like, they just keep, it's, it's too much where you're like, all right, man, I get it. You're the, you're the king of the cannabis, dude. You invented it. Yeah. Uh, where he's more just like, Hey, this is how it is. Smoke it, you know? And then obviously the grow off and other individuals and the, the gray market kind of speaks to me. That speaks for volumes over really anything else is if, uh, if people want to, uh, come purchase that product and then come and ask for it by name again. And I think Blue Dreams is one of those originals uh, that people felt that way. And maybe it gets a bad rap for a variety of reasons, but that paid the mortgage, you know, for yep. a lot of people. And I think that's, um, and, and people that wanted it. Yeah, people wanted it. So it, it crossed uh, the boxes for some people on all things because it made money. Um, and then it was also being asked for. It. And so, especially back then in the early days, you would just grow a bunch of cannabis and then you'd hope people would want it. And the, the unscrupulous type people sometimes would just uh, make, make uh, you know, whatever you ask for, that's what they had, you know? And I, I think that yep. now the consumer knows the bullshit. So if you have Durban poison, I think most people know that it has a very unique smell. Uh, that the buds are usually a little bit bigger, like a blue dream. So if you got small little nugs that smell like something else, then obviously this person's playing games with you. So there's a lot uh -huh. to just being educated, um, obviously in those days for flower. And I'm bringing this up because I think more people, it's the same thing now with seeds. So that you realize that I think a lot of people can get misled or think that if I spend five hundred dollars on F ones, that means that I have some kind of magic in a in a bag, and it's really more you just bought a five hundred dollar lottery ticket. Boom. Hundred uh, percent. Sorry, I muted myself. This one's for Marco actually. Um, so hash slinging hasher. <laughs> I like that. How can I legally collect IMO around me? I'm in the city, but I can find some bushes around a trail. Okay. Well, I, my rules are the the healthiest, most diverse forest area closest to you or vegetation closest to you. So whatever you have is that if that's the closest, if it's away from streets, if it's somewhat secluded, you know, away from motor traffic and that kind of stuff, give it a shot. You know, you can also collect my IMO indoors. You know, you're kind of collecting what you have, but at least it's familiarizing you with the process. Um, you know, sometimes you have to just take a little short drive, find a park in your area. Um, baseball fields. A lot of times, you know, that land right behind the baseball and the football fields, that woods back there, it's all usually county owned, but no one goes back there. Those could be good places to go to. Um, keep an open mind. Bars for you, Marco. Bars for you, Marco. Damn it. Hey, hey thank you. <laughs> yeah, he's always bringing that. Uh, here, here's the last question. And like I said, we're going to really respect people's time. So uh, we want to keep this quick and then uh, we'll keep it moving for next week. Uh, but yeah, they want to know how is nerds outdoors, Rob? Um, you know, so we, we've been able to test in a bunch of different environments now. Um, and normally what we've found is anything that we test indoors generally tests well outdoors, but doesn't mean it's necessarily a winner. Um, so there are certain strains that we have found that are, are better than others for outdoor cultivation. Um, but it, it's uh, really dependent on, on what you're looking for. Like some of the strains that we've made are, are very uh, resistant to pest and disease and do great outdoors uh, um, as far as yield go. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, uh, the Wody crosses are excellent because they uh, finish super fast. Um, they're all um, one of the first things that, that start to flower and then one of the first things that finish flower in the season. Um, so if you're in a place where time pressure is uh, a thing, then, then that matters. Um, but it's a hard question to answer because uh, growing things in Colorado was so wildly different than growing things in Oklahoma, which is so wildly different than growing things in California. So um, depending on how your environment is, there are certain things that are going to be better for, um, you know, humidity, arid climates, longer days, shorter days, higher, more or less stress um, than others. Um, and it's, it's a real broad question. Um, so I apologize for that. But the, the short answer is that some, an some of them do really, really well. Um, certainly, uh, we had some plants that were 15 feet in, in June this year. 
uh, by the end of June, they were just, they were massive. Um, and so, uh, you never really know until you put them outside and, and you see what they're going to do in your own environment. Um, but we do our best to, to test them in every environment that we can. And we're, we're trying to put out something that you're going to find something that, uh, you like in, in, in any kind of growing space. So, you know, if you are running out our stuff and you like, you put out something that, um, didn't do well in your particular environment, um, then please actually hit us up. We want to know. We want that information. We want to know why it didn't do well, like what kinds of things that it faced that it hadn't faced in our test grows. And, you know, like that kind of information starts to build the relationship that, that brings this community together. And MJ will tell you that, you know, like when you're helping us out, we're going to be giving you seats. You know, and we're going to be like trying to to further this this dialogue so that we can learn together as a community. Because like, um, you know, at the end of the day, I can only grow so many plants, I can only view so many plants, I can only be in so many environments. But all of us as a community can answer some of these questions on such a broad scale in a way that no other science experiment really can. And so, you know, tell us. We want to know. Um, try them and then like if it doesn't work then please let us know and look, let's figure out why so we can figure out something that will work for you so and we Bars. appreciate yeah the candid answers you know there's a lot of breeders out there that really kind of just run through that stuff uh, and in my opinion I think Marco would back me up here is they might not know it because they're not putting in the work and so right. I, I think when the consumer is a little bit educated uh, and now has a, enough knowledge to maybe ask the right questions when they go to the expos, how are things done? I, I, that's going to further the, just the process of better cannabis, better medicine for all. Uh, I wanted to give it over to Marco and then um, I'd like to shut it down, boys, because we we always go over and we, uh, we're trying I to know. do it. And, and the show's, when the show's so good, I'm the main one that usually complains, but man, when the show's <laughs> good, you got to keep it going. So this was great, yeah. Bobby. I, I appreciate you, man. You lit some fires in me. You said that Duke, you know, and the other people lit fires in you. You get lit a few things in me, man. And I thank you for the, um, the straight up answers. Like if anybody's trying to, you know, and I just want to breed for myself, my own little thing, but anybody out there that wants to go serious and take it even farther, man, the stuff that, that Robbie dropped on me today is valuable, man. Like watch this shit again. Don't be, you know, lose, you know, forward through it and find those spots and um, take this info and, and move forward. And I'm just going to keep moving forward and uh, doing my thing. appreciate y'all. Can I just say before we go, like if you are, wanting to be a breeder out there this show was about breeding do it today's the day start find a space do it at any scale the you're you're capable go out and 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 make it happen because together the the information's out there you know people want to want to help you so uh just keep it going keep this community together and keep it alive and and thank everybody um for doing the show today it's been awesome yeah i wanted uh any out. last words yeah from you mj any last words or anything buddy i always want to say i always i'm always gonna give big shout outs to big rob i'm always gonna give shout outs to you and marco for putting the podcast together always having good uh people that are honest uh that 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 necessarily don't want to be in the forefront front of this whole thing some people that don't even never want to even want to be on any of this are willing to get on and give some information back to the community some of these bigger companies don't do that i can call robbie when we hang up this phone he'll still want to talk for two or three more hours you know what i mean so i appreciate him and everything he's done for us myself definitely my family my community my community uh within where i live and the community that you guys have um uh, inquired here on the uh, podcast as well. Shout out to you, Rob. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks. Hey, can I say one more thing? Um, everybody who's watching, please hit the like button. Please hit the follow button. Make sure that these guys build a bigger audience. Like it really does make a big difference. The more that you interact with this show, the more that you comment, the more that you like the show, the more that you follow it, 
the better chances are that they're going to get out to a bigger audience and they're going to be able to spread this knowledge further. So you really are doing a big part by doing that. And uh, please go out and, and make sure you do that on any podcast or any like source that you appreciate the, the knowledge from. Yeah, and I'd say, uh, you know, we want to give a salute, Marco and I, to London, who's in a way teaching us uh, a lot of this stuff. So, uh, you know, just trying to learn more about um, the back end, how to make things you know, just better. You know, I'm at a loss for words of trying to describe this being being stoned for three hours. But on the, on the back end, yeah, seamless, where we're actually, you know, we, and we can uh, communicate with you guys in real time. That's something that I think is uh, special about this show uh, that we can have sit here, have dialogue. You know, this is the first time I ever sat here and actually looked at the chat. Uh, and I didn't see one person that was uh, being, uh, you know, shady or negative in any way. And that's exactly what I would love to see from each and every show, each and every week as all that nonsense is pointless. Anyway, we're here to learn. Um, and I, that's something that I think Marco and I pride ourselves on is that the, the nonsense and all that kind of stuff is for other shows. We're just here trying to use our time as best we can, uh, you know, give it to you guys and bring on guests like we did today with Rob and MJ, where you might not necessarily have ever heard of these gentlemen uh, because they don't necessarily want to be heard from. And it's more me just reaching out. And now that Rob's, you know, big, big time star, uh, you know, that I think that it's fun for, for a lot of us to see you uh, having success. Uh, and that's something that uh, that, that we um, it li- I like it, man. I love to see my friends shine. I love to see people that I know uh, finding success and monetizing things. Yes, you have to make money in the world. People always start to hate on you when you got a little money in your pocket. But there has to be there has to be positive things that come from people that are constantly giving. MJ, uh, myself, I feel like Marco, we're, we're constantly doing that stuff. Rob is, you know, has that in spades, obviously gave away seeds to, from today. So I hope that more people just give uh, for 2023. That's what a lot of these shows uh, started out to be. Uh, it didn't start out to be anything drama whatsoever. It was all about just giving back to the community because I and maybe that was why we created that flyer a little bit, Marco, is we got lucky. I feel like I got very lucky that I didn't get caught up in some of the things that my peers got caught up in or being at the wrong house at, at, yeah. at a certain time. And then everybody's going down because they're hanging out there. And those are real things that happen to people. So remember who you're hanging out with. Remember who your friends are. Uh, and remember where you get your seeds. Uh, till we see you <laughs> next week. And uh, London, are you on there? Because um, I want to give you a shout out, buddy, if you're on the back end. Give him a couple seconds here. Uh, Shout so out guys, Hillbilly Cannabis. Hillbilly. If you don't know, London I'm, I'm is on the back in the middle of some. I'm in a little bit in the middle of some, so I'm not going to go visibly on. But yes, yes, I am oh, here. Okay. You guys are killing it. I look forward to seeing your show every single week. I got a ton of killer content coming up. We're going to be up in Spain. We're going to be nice. showing you the new house in Italy and the new regenerative farm that we'll be setting up. Uh, we got the Road to Unicorn Cup, which is happening, which is a big deal. We got a lot of fun stuff. So don't like you know hang out and and keep your eye out for fun stuff and do exactly what everybody said like follow share do all that stuff that's important it helps drive us forward we worldwide man we are worldwide and if you're lucky enough to watch this show internationally then reach out to it well i guess if three b through daga but you're buying rob's gear and i promise you you're going to be able to create this own little stable uh, for yourself because nobody else has those genetics and those are the kind of things that are allow you to start to build a brand for yourself people want to wear your hats they want to wear your t-shirt shout out to steensland even right mm-hmm. i think uh what's his name uh created the cultivating classics created your hat that's the kind know. of stuff that i think the community likes you can't buy this shit in the stores for the most part right it's whether it, you know about the community or you don't and that's something that i think you know especially marco you're rocking today so a legend and i somewhere. bought these i bought my hat i bought Hell my yeah. stuff i buy my stuff because i like to support our people out there i ain't gonna be talking about let me get this for free you know what i mean we got to support our people bro that's all I hook a brother up. right yeah. hook up hook up <laughs> rob i'll give you tight, maybe we could hook up but right now you know you got support <laughs> rob i'll give you the last word and then we're gonna cut it sir man it's been a great time uh, I, I really appreciate all of you guys for, for spending the last three hours with me. It's been a joy. So uh, thank you, and everybody have a great night. Excellent. We'll, we'll see you guys next week. Jadam event. Jadam, uh, February, hit me up. Anybody going? Chat? Yeah, we should, talk, we should start talking about that, huh? Exactly.
Heather, hit Shut me up. I know you got your seeds. All right, we'll see you guys next week. Peace.